Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's seminar, The Lifelong Fight from Rhetoric to Action. My name is Katrin Kiswani, and I am the president of MSF here in Sweden. We have invited you all here today to keep HIV on the agenda, and I'm happy to see that so many could participate. We are also streaming today and we welcome those of you around the world that has tuned in. A special welcome to all our speakers from far and near that has taken time to come here today and share their knowledge and experience and also to challenge us. A special thank you also go to Postcode Lotteriet for funding this seminar and the project in, Quas uh, uh, in KwaZulu Natal. The lifelong fight that HIV patients are facing has been on the agenda of MSF for a long time and it's far from over. These fights or struggles are ongoing in many places around the world and the situation looks different for our patients depending on where they live. Some are struggling to access information about HIV. Others are fighting to attest so they can find out their status. Some are trying to get access to ART treatment and others to find the strength to stay on treatment. And all are fighting against the everyday stigma of HIV. We have come a long way since the international community refused to treat AIDS patients in the developing world, which resulted in MSF struggling in antiretroviral treatment, sorry, that MSF smuggling in antiretroviral tre treatment into South Africa and Thailand to show that it was possible to treat. These actions were met with overwhelming international skepticism. We have come a long way since MSF launched the Access Campaign back in the 1999 and started to push for access to, at that time, very expensive medicines and diagnostic tests. The struggle, together with the Treatment Action Campaign, TAC, that we have the honor of having with us today and other civil society representatives resulted in a drop of costs from 10,000 USD per year to 350 US dollars. And 15 years down the line, these pioneering efforts have saved millions of lives. Together, we have made a lot of advantages, but in recent years, we have seen a decline in funding engagement worldwide, which has put scaling up and the development of new pre preventative and treatment options at risk. Here, Sweden has played a big role internationally as a donor. Now we are facing new challenges with HIV, uh, with an HIV epidemic that is changing with more and more concentration on HIV patients in middle income countries. Being a middle income country, the possibility to receive funding is more complicated. Other, another new challenge is the aging HIV patient population with chronic diseases in need of more care. One of our biggest challenges though is the adherence. It's not enough to start treatment, you have to stay on treatment. And to stay on treatment we can't look at a patient like a statistic. We need to see their needs transfer ownership of the treatment and together build support structures. 
the best way that we have found so far is a mix of lay councillors and community adherence clubs along with more con conventional methods of care. The lay councillors is providing direct support to the patient and their treatment. In the groups, the members support each other along with taking turns in getting the medication for the other members. It is these two ways of simplifying the life of the patients along with other task shifting initiatives that community-based models of care that we believe make scaling up access to treatment possible. The UNAIDS 1990 90 target, where they by 2020 aim for that 90% of all people living with HIV will know their HIV status, 90% of all people with diagnosed HIV in infection will receive sustained antiretroviral therapy and 90% of all people receiving antiretroviral therapy will have viral suppression. These targets are ambitious. We can't reach them by just doing more of what we al are already doing. More of the same is not enough. We need to start listening to the patients and simplify HIV care. In short, we need to pr bring the treatment and support closer to the patient and keep international solidarity on the agenda. <coughs> HIV is also forcing M MSF to challenge ourselves. To challenge our organization and staff with the formidable tasks of so, uh, so sustainability. The challenge of creating long-term cooperation with different Ministry of Health around the world, challenging us with finding ways of providing <coughs> HIV care in conflict setting and in countries with extremely weak healthcare systems. Armed with years of experience on how to best implement HIV treatment strategies, to improve care, and with the 230,000 HIV patients under our care, MSF is still learning, discussing, and changing just as vigorously as ever. That's why we are here today, to learn, to discuss, exchange ideas, change, and act. I want you to leave this room today empowered, believing that together we can go from talking to acting. Thank you and once again welcome to HIV, a lifelong fight from rhetoric to action. I have uh, as well the honor to present our moderator for the day, Carolina Jemsby. Carolina is uh, an experienced freelance journalist who has worked, reported and done documentary film from many different parts of the world. She was nominated to the Journalist Award, the Golden Spade. Carolina also have has lived in South Africa between 2003 and 2009, where she worked as a correspondent from South Africa. Carolina has done stories from MSF, in, uh, from MSF fieldwork and did as well an adventurous journey in the Democratic Republic of Congo with MSF Sweden's uh, press officer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to have you uh, with us, Carolina. 
thank you very much. Thank you, and uh, once again, I just would like to say to all of you here and those of you who are following us on the web, welcome and good morning, and I'm convinced that we're going to have a very interesting day here together. Uh, just some quick information. Toilets are just outside here, just very easy to find, but please try to, to plan for breaks. And, uh, <laughs> and then there is another rule here that I've already broken, but that is no coffee inside here, apparently. So you're welcome to drink water, but um, the, the owners of this location, of this venue, don't want us to drink coffee here. And if you tweet, please do, uh, and please use the hashtag MSFHIV15. And uh, we're already running a few minutes behind schedule, but I will ask all the different speakers here today to, to stay within their 15 minutes that they've been given to, to so that we'll follow the time schedule as, as well as we can. And I hope all of you will have the opportunity to stay the full day. Um, there will be interesting discussions. And uh, I believe that we live in a time now where development goes in two different directions at the same time. A lot of things in the world are getting better, but in the same time, we also see huge challenges ahead of us, the war in Syria, the situation for the refugees, the climate change, which, you know, the climate meeting starts today in Paris. And uh, I think one concrete example on how development si simultaneously goes in two different directions is, um, is the global health care. We see, as Katrine spoke about, many previously poor countries increasing their gross national income, their GNI, and moving into being classified as so-called middle-income countries, which means often decreased grants, decreased aid and donor support. More is supposed to be covered by the countries themselves. But, as all of you know, some more than others, maybe. Increased GNI doesn't automatically mean that more money goes into the health sector. And today we have a reality in the world where 70% of the world's poor and sick live in middle income countries, where the three major killers are HIV AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. And there are giant challenges facing both these countries in battling the disease and also the donor and the NGO communities on how to work more efficiently with this, these diseases in these countries. And we're here today to focus on one way that could be the way forward maybe in replying to these challenges and that is supporting the system of the lay councillors. And we'll talk more specifically about that after 11. And uh, we'll start now with the fight against HIV in a challenging, in a changing world. world. HIV AIDS used to be on top of the news agenda, especially when we talked about Sub-Saharan Africa. Me, myself, I did so many reports on HIV AIDS, I, many stories on TAC, for example. I'm happy that you are here today. And nowadays, we rarely hear about it. Uh, I've been asked why, I, why I'm carrying, why I'm having this on me, because a lot of people tell me, but AIDS isn't really a problem anymore, is it? but you all know that that is a problem. We need to keep it on the agenda. There is still 1.2 million people dying from AIDS or AIDS-related diseases every year. And I'm happy to present to you Mr. Tobias Alvien, medical doctor and senior researcher on global health at Karolinsk Institute. And he will provide us with a map on how the current <laughs> epidemic looks like. Welcome. Thank you very much and good morning colleagues and friends. And first, a big thanks to MSF for organizing this day. And I think World AIDS Day, it's always an important day, but it's even maybe more important this year, 2015, the end of the Millennium Development Goals and the beginning of the Sustainable Development Goals with all the possibilities, but also challenges, like you said now. So let's see if my slides are here. Yeah, that's my slides. So I've been asked, to setting the scene and painting a map of the current epidemic. And in doing this, I would like us to move back to the year 2000. 
and the fireworks they had just stopped and the world was preparing for the Millennium Summit. And in less than 20 years, AIDS had spread to all parts of the world. It had shown it had a devastating effect on many countries, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa. And on the first page of the UN AIDS Global Report Year 2000, it was written, AIDS in a new millennium, a grim picture with glimmers of hope. And almost all the curves were going in the wrong direction. In the year 2000, every year, there were three million new HIV infections, of which more than 500,000 were among children. And less than one million people got access to antiretroviral therapy. And there were even colleagues, exactly like you said now, Katrine, that were challenging that it would be good to actually provide people in Sub-Saharan Africa with it. They said, no, it's not worth it. It's too expensive. We shouldn't do it. And at the same time, because of that, two million people died because of AIDS-related uh, causes every year. And still, less than five billion US dollars were spent on AIDS every single year. And also in the year 2000, 92 countries in the world, they were criminalizing same-sex relationships. And if you took an HIV test, it took you three days to get the result. And in the year 2000, if you were lucky to actually get access to ART, you needed to take an average eight different pills. And if you got these eight pills, you or someone else had to pay $10,000 a year to get that. But as I said, on the first page of the UNAIDS Global Report, there were also glimmers of hope and pushed by civil society. And I really think civil society did something great in moving up to the year 2000, telling world leaders that we can't miss this. It's something special, the new millennium, we need to use this. And thanks to civil society in Kofi Annan, I would say almost all world leaders met for the Millennium Summit in New York and agreed on the Millennium Development Goals. These eight goals, of which three were directly related to health and one of them directly to AIDS, MDG 6A, have halted by 2015 and begun to reverse the spread of HIV AIDS. And what happened then in 15 years? New HIV infections from 3 million to 2 million a year among children, the decrease is even larger, down to a bit more than 200,000. And people said, no way we can't get more people on ART. But now we have more than 15 million people in 15 years' time on ART. And AIDS-related deaths, they have been decreased to 1.2 million. And the investment for the AIDS response, it's up to 22 billion US dollars a year in just 15 years' time. And people also say, you can't change how countries actually have laws, but it's possible. Look at it. The number of countries that criminalize same-sex relationship from 92 down to 76. We've even managed to do this, not just getting people on treatment. And also, it took you three days to get an HIV test result, right? Now it's 30 minutes. And at the same time, now people, more than half of all the people actually needing ARTs, they get it. And instead of taking eight pills a day, most of them can take one. And the cost from 10,000 to first-line regiments in low-income countries to 100 US dollars a year. So if we look at it, did we manage to halt by 2015 and begin to reverse the spread of HIV AIDS? Well, the decrease in new infections is 35%. Among kids, it's even 58%. And AIDS-related deaths down by 42%. So we must really celebrate and say, yes, we managed to fulfill the MDG 6 point. 6A, we did reverse the spread of HIV AIDS. However, if we look at HIV this year, and some people, as you said, why did we mirror the pin? No, the AIDS epidemic is not over. If we look at the world map today, or actually at the end of 2014, where we have the latest data, 37 million still live with HIV, and the large majority two-thirds in sub-Saharan Africa. And this number, it's increasing every year due to that more and more people get access to life-saving therapy and they're living healthier and better lives. So some people, when they say, oh, you just see the curves, they go in the wrong direction, more and more people live with HIV. Well, we want people living with HIV to stay alive, but we don't get 
want more people to get infected. And sometimes that's complicated to explain for people outside this room, not in this room. And if we look at the number of new infections, as I said, it's down to 2 million, but still 2 million new infections of something that actually more or less possible to prevent. It's a shame. And again, three-fourths of that almost is in sub-Saharan Africa. And if we look at it, we know that some people are particularly vulnerable to HIV. Men who have sex with men are 19 times more likely to believe in that with HIV than other people. People who inject drugs, 28 times more likely. Uh, sex workers, 12 times more likely. And transgender women, 49 times more likely than the general population to live with HIV. And if we look at it globally, of the two million new HIV infections, approximately 30% are among these key population. 4% sex workers, 6% people inject drugs, 18% men have sex with men, and about 7% clients to sex workers. And in a majority of countries outside Sub-Saharan Africa, a majority of people getting infected in 2015 are among these key populations. And still, we said it had decreased from 2 million to 1.2 AIDS-related deaths. But it's still, it's an awful lot. 1.2 million people dying each year because of something that we again can prevent. And again, a majority of this, two-thirds, it's in sub-Saharan Africa. So we see HIV continues to shine a harsh light on the inequalities of the world. And AIDS, it's an unfinished business. And we know... The MDGs, they will actually end now in exactly 31 days, right? Because the end date of the MDGs, now people have stopped talking about it, but they're actually not completely over. But we now have the new development agenda, the Sustainable Development Goals. And some people, they say that, oh, health is not very much in here any longer. But health is almost all in here. And it's showing even better how everything is related. You can't have a healthy development without having a social, economic, environmental development together. And some of the 17 goals, they're more related to the AIDS response. Of course, SDG number three, good health, it's also there we can find the directly new AIDS goal. Gender equality, it's a core goal in here as well. Reduced inequalities, peace and justice, and partnerships for the goals. And I really think that we need and we can and we must use the SDGs as the framework. And as we can see, the new UNAIDS strategy is based around the SDGs. However, to reach the SDGs and actually reach the end of AIDS, we need to be smarter. We need to look different. And we often, when we talk about the AIDS epidemic, we talk about that the prevalence in country hmm, is this, and the incidence in country that is that. But that's not enough. And this is a map of Kenya, showing Kenya, we all know, here. And these are showing the 47 different counties in Kenya. And the darker the green, the higher the number of new HIV infections every year. Approximate, there are 60,000 new HIV infections in 2015 in Kenya. And in the small counties here, in the dark green, there are more than 5,000 new HIV infections. And in the large areas here, it's just 250 or less than 250 new HIV infections every single year. So, what we have shown, UNAIDS, together with the Kenya Minister of Health, is that if we continue everything as normal, there will continue to be approximately 60,000 new HIV infections every single year. If we instead roll out a true combination prevention, combining prevention efforts together with a rollout ART program that will be decreased to maybe 30, 20,000 a year. But if that is combined with a real geographical prioritization, really targeting the areas where you have most people living with HIV and the highest transmission, and also looking at key populations in these groups, you will reduce it down to 10,000. So we cannot continue doing business just because we said, oh, look, we were so good in the last 15 years. Let's continue. No, that's not enough. And as I said before, key populations, 
and for example, especially people who inject drugs, it's very difficult, and many countries neglect them completely. And it's really, it's punitive laws, it's fear, it's stigma, it's discrimination, and it's even violence. And people, living, um, people injecting drugs, it's a very, very difficult life. And if you look at it from uh, the HIV angle, it's also in many countries neglected, and people say, no, we can't do this. And just look at what happens sometimes in Sweden when we talk about people inject drugs. But some countries are more pragmatic, and uh, if you will look in Yunnan in southern China, it's here in southwestern China, it's one of the provinces most hardly hit by HIV in China. And we'll, they looked at the map, and again, the darker, the green, the more people living with HIV, and most of these infections are due to injecting drug use. And then you see the numbers, and then the numbers in parentheses. It's the number of methadone clinics and the number of people on methadone maintenance. And it's exactly, they looked, okay, here we have many people living with HIV and a lot of drug users. Then we should target these provinces. It's again being very pragmatic, targeting the AIDS epidemic where the epidemic actually is. And these are just two examples from the new UNAIDS World AIDS Day report focused on location and population and how we think and how things should be done differently if we want to achieve something in the coming 15 years. And I would like to finish with a quote from UNAIDS which I think summarizes this very, very well. Ending the AIDS epidemic is achievable if we focus on people accessing the right services delivered in the right places. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I think you can have a seat there on the second chair is your name. And you can actually bring the microphone with you. Uh, can I just ask you one short question? Of course. Uh, on, uh, w when you were showing the map of Kenya and you could see the high numbers of new infected in the western parts of Kenya, would you say that rolling out ARTs there would manage to decrease those numbers or what would be the quick fix? I don't think there is one quick fix and I think that's really what the lessons learned are. You have to combine it, but I think ART is one of the critical components and rolling out ART with community mobilization and also getting prevention working together. And I think that's, again, we need to talk about combination prevention. Some people in some countries believe that if we just roll out our ART, we don't need to do anything else. We don't need to talk about structural issues. We don't need to discuss laws, but it's not enough. If people are still afraid going to the clinic, getting their pills, of course it's not enough to roll out. People have to be and actually be, okay, it's fine. You can go and take an HIV test and it's okay to discuss it. So I think it's so the combination prevention. in that area combined with ARTs, combined with information and would... That's a very yeah. good start, yeah. yeah. Great. But Thank again, you. looking at the map, where is the mm -hmm. HIV epidemic? And not mm -hmm. just saying that the prevalence or the incidence in this country is this and then rolling it out the same. That's really hindering the response and I think that's very important. And that's also that we have been better now. We use It was difficult to get granular data like this, but it's getting better and better and that we use technology and we use mobile phones, etc. that we'll hear more about later today. Great, thank you. Um, Leave no one behind is an expression that I think you recognize not only from American military operations but also in the struggle of HIV AIDS or against HIV AIDS. And Kerstin Åkefeldt from MSF will speak about the funding challenges in the AIDS response. Can we really do more with less and leave no one behind? Welcome. Can you hear me? Okay. Great. Um, so I just see how I do this. No. Um, oh, there we are. So we are at the unique point in time, I think it's been said before, and discussions about funding challenges in the AIDS response have intensified over the past few years. and especially with in view of ambitious targets such as ending AIDS by 2030 and, um, and uh, expanding treatment to all people with HIV. 
funding challenges and, and a call for increased overall funding is maybe more important than ever. Um, and in these discussions, we hear, as, as Carolina said, the expressions like leaving no one behind, and but also the need to do more with less sometimes. So in addition to looking at um, figures on actual spending and projected figures, I will also try to look at the reality behind some of these expressions as we see them. So as Tobias has already explained, there's been remarkable progress. Um, I will not repeat this. This is exactly the same figures just out. Uh, but also reminding of that 60% of people that are living with HIV still don't have access to treatment. And I think what is really important is to remember that these global figures are hiding uh, disparities between countries and regions. So just to illustrate that a bit, I don't know how much you can see the details, but the this is a graph showing coverage rates. Um, these bubbles are not as dynamic as Hans Rosling's, I'm afraid, but uh, the, the blue bubbles to the left, they represent countries um, in, in uh, Eastern Europe, uh, sorry, Eastern uh, and Southern Africa, um, and by size of the population affected and coverage, the vertical axis is the coverage rate. And we can see in the green um, in the middle is Western Central Africa. That's a region that represents 7 million people living with HIV. But they are well below the 40% coverage average. Around 25% of people have access in this region to treatment. So it's just to show, and I think we, we uh, as MSF, we've been trying to recognize this and say that we are actually calling for um, a catch-up plan for these countries. But there are also other regions that are affected in the same way, uh, that are falling behind, such as Middle East and Northern Africa and Eastern Europe, Central Asia. So uh, I think when we talk about progress, we have to really remember that international success must be measured wherever people are. Um, and uh, when we look at some of the policies and the funding environment, uh, this is something really important to remember that not to pit different countries against each other in the, in the sort of uh, competition for, for funding. So over the past actually over the past few months only we've seen quite some ambitious targets and goals being agreed by world leaders um, not least ending AIDS by 2030 is part of the sustainable development goals and also UNAIDS and its members including Sweden also agreed to a new strategy for the next five years uh, with the notion of during the next five years there's a window of a unique opportunity to actually bend the curve but we need to front load investments um, and by doing that, we will be able to reach the so-called 390s, the 90% of people know their status and 90% of them have access to treatment and 90% of them are also have their viral um, load and their blood suppressed. So at the same time, and, and I think also it re really important to remind of the WHO, re the recommendations from WHO to actually treat everyone with um, HIV um, upon diagnosis and removing all of these um, eligibility uh, limitations will, will mean that 37 million people are now el eligible for treatment. So these policies and targets are all inter interlinked and um, all of them recognize the role of community models and communities to, to advance progress. And while all of these are all really worthy and important targets and strategies, we are also confronted with a number of important challenges. So for MSF, some of these key concerns are include the capacity and willingness in countries to adopt new policies and recommendations, the weak systems in countries, both in stable and unstable settings with varying ability to provide and scale up quality of services. Uh, human resources and procurement supply chain management are sometimes weak links that needs to be strengthened if we want to see progress. And both in country, countries and at international level, um, HIV is at risk of losing momentum. And not least then, of course, financial resources that is needed to um, allow for this boost uh, to reach the targets that I will talk about more now because uh, looking back at the funding evolution, where are we today? Um, we've seen an incredible, impressive increase in resources over the past 10 years. Um, and but we're also seeing now that these, this increase is starting to level off. Uh, 
as to be as mentioned, the total investments in the AIDS response is now projected for this year to be at 21.7 billion US dollars. Uh, if this turns out to be correct, this means a slight increase from last year, which was actually a dip last year. More than half of the funds are actually coming now from domestic funding from countries themselves and um, in low and middle income countries. So it's important to remember that funding, the current funding levels have been possible thanks to global solidarity and shared responsibility. So what does the projected funding need look like? Uh, UNAIDS, according to UNAIDS, uh, to reach the 390s target and to bend the curves in the next five years, with the international community needs to front load investments and to increase to 31.1 billion US dollars annually by 2020. And this means a gap of approximately 10 billion compared to the current levels of funding. Or if you put it in a different way, the world uh, needs to increase funding by 2 billion per year on average over the next five years. At the same time, we observe how leveling off of resources already having affecting countries um, and we're seeing funding gaps um, having impact on countries like Mozambique, for example. They embarked on a very ambitious treatment acceleration plan to expand access to treatment, but uncertainty about funding has, is risking now to put these plans on hold. And other countries are delaying upgrades of uh, their treatment guidelines, such as earlier initiation on treatment or better treatment regimens and decentralization of care. Um, evidence based programming, as was mentioned, uh, by, for targeting key populations um, are also being put on hold. We see that in some of the proposals to the Global Fund, for example. Civil society organizations have also felt the decline, and I'm sure other speakers will speak about that as well. Uh, this is despite the fact that UNAIDS and, and all the, the latest evidence show that we really need to focus more on communities. Um, so the challenges to, to reach these targets mean that we, we need immediate action to send strong signals and encourage countries to move forward with the right strategies. So we can't wait for if we are to meet these targets. So taking a look at some of the funding trends ahead, um, there are many of them, but just to mention a few. Uh, donor funding, so not just international funding overall, uh, but in international donor funding is also levelling off um, after international financial crisis in 2008. Uh, we've seen a marginal increase in 2014, thanks to an increase from the UK government to the Global Fund. Uh, but with limited resources available, we also hear donors talking about the need to, va to focus on value for money and to do more with less. But without a new push, uh, these levels of donor funding might stagnate further or even decrease. And uh, UNAIDS estimates that if we are able to front load now, we will actually see uh, the funding needs to t start to, to, to peak and start to decline by 2021. So, and not, so not just sort of risking the, uh, the op uh, missing the opportunity of cost savings in the future, but also of course to, to bend the curves. So, for example, the Global Fund replenishment in 2016 is a critical moment for such a new push. And Sweden has been one of the most important donors. In, and I think their, their continued support will be really important. Another worrying trend is the concentration of donors. In 2014, uh, about 87% of international funding came from five donors. And the US government represented two thirds of, in, of donor funding. Um, contributions to the Global Fund went up and more and more donors are cha challenge, uh, channeling their, their funds through the Global Fund. So when we're seeing so much of the funding for treatment going through the Global Fund and the US PEPFAR initiative, we really need to see these, these uh, mechanisms pro appropriately funded and functioning and being able to deliver for countries. We also see many competing priorities, as mentioned, the, the sustainable development goals, uh, although interlinked, uh, this is often also used as an excuse to, uh, to say there are many, many goals and, and HIV is just one of them. But I think it will be important to highlight that the impact of an effective HIV response will also have positive impact on other health goals. Um, the fact that uh, HIV is the leading cause of death for women uh, in reproductive age and the second killer of adolescents in the world is, is quite important reminders for health goals. Other trends, oh, there's something that happened there uh, with the pictures, sorry about that. Um, 
the the first trend there is uh, a narrowing focus, and this is what Tobias mentioned, um, how we are now learning through lessons learned and through new evidence to narrow focus down on where the where are the epidemics, which countries, which populations, um, to better but to better tailor uh, these interventions according to the epidemics is really important. But at the same time, we don't we we're seeing a trend to focus on the highest prevalence and uh, highest population countries, and there's a risk as we see to actually lose focus on some of these lower prevalence, lower coverage countries, such as those in Western Central Africa. Domestic spending has been driving uh, the rise in international funding overall over the years, uh, which is really encouraging. Um, but there are some projections that are quite positive, whereas others are more less uh, optimistic, let's say. Um, for example, a, a study in the Lancet in 2014 projected that many of the sub-Saharan countries were not would not be able to independently finance their response, um, uh, even if they meet the Abuja target of 15, spending 15% of their um, uh, budget on, on health. So um, just to caution about two optimistic cal calculations there. Uh, this picture is supposed to symbolize the, the trend of that more countries are now transitioning from low to middle income countries status. Um, and this is used as an argument by many donors to pull funding out of middle income countries. When using blunt gene criteria such as uh, GNI per capita, rather than looking at countries' actual ability to pay, um, looking at, for example, fiscal space or uh, the size of taxable po population, we, we risk seeing funding being withdrawn too early, prematurely, and that gains will be lost. So even if a country is able to finance more, it, it's also a matter of political willi will and, and willingness to pay. Um, this is a political problem, but it's, it can tr be translated into a medical problem for the people living in these countries. Um, and finally, to diversify income, countries are also advised to, to consider innovative financing solutions such as HIV levies and so-called sin taxes, uh, t taxes on tobacco and alcohol, for example. So these can be, of course, important contributions. But again, uh, a country like Malawi, w there, was a, there was a study showing that even if this country would do all it can on innovation, innovative financing, uh, it would only be able to finance 20% of its response anyway. So I, I think in combination, uh, new innovative financing is important, also at international level, looking at financial transaction taxes, um, of course, an increase in private sector funding. We, all, we need all of these sources in the response. Um, just to focus a little bit more on this trend of middle-income countries, it was mentioned by Tobias as well and others, but um, I think that just as a reminder that already today most people living with HIV live in middle-income countries and UNAIDS is projecting by 2020 that only 13% of people living with HIV will be living in low-income countries. Um, so, and to the right you see um, UNAIDS estimated uh, shares between the, what's, what is expected from lower income countries, lower middle income countries and upper middle income countries to, f to spend on um, domestic funding versus international funding. So it's just important to, to remember uh, what is realistic here and not use these as strict targets, but rather estimates. For example, are new middle income countries like Kenya and Myanmar able to spend 45% uh, to finance by 45% their own response? Uh, so to reach the targets, again, our countries, both country funding and international funders will be needed. And let's not be overly pessimistic about donor finances and overly optimistic about domestic funds. And this is just, I wanted to show you, this is a very recent study from uh, that came out last week, actually, in, in the PLOS um, uh, Medical Journal. It shows it's a study of funding needs for uh, treatment at facility level, uh, what is needed in terms of funding for scaling up access to treatment and to reach the 390s. And they conclude that countries, to actually reach these targets, countries need to go for a test and offer approach. 
and the funding needs for this 52.5 bil billion over a six year period is actually lower than many other studies have shown. Um, I'm just putting it out there and we can discuss, but the funding gap today over the six years would be uh, roughly 25 billion with this scenario compared to, uh, well, eight, almost 20 with the lower scenario. Finally, just to conclude, um, the, this focus on value for money, I think it's, and, and can we do more with, uh, with less? It's, it's important to remember if we are going to reach the target, there will be a need for additional fin finances. Um, so the answer could, could be said to be no in that sense, that doing more with less will not do. Um, and we need increases from both countries and donors alike. We also need to look at funding uh, being directed towards people-centered approaches and to measure result at patient level. Are, the fund, are funding and services actually reaching people at the periphery? Um, the call for a better focus on countries and people should not become a cover story for rationing of services due to limited resources. And we need better tailored responses, but the disease response must continue to have a global reach. And finally, if we say, if we talk about leaving no, no one behind, uh, we need immediate action. And in order to upgrade and implement the WHO guideline, uh, there must be a mobilization of both political will and financial support. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. You can keep that one on. And I think this is your seat. We're going to have a short panel debate after the next two speakers. Uh, I think it is an amazing thought with this window of opportunities, having a five years window now where we can actually do a real change. And then obviously, of course, it is related to the willingness of the donors. And I'm very happy to present one of the representatives of the donors. Mr. Lennart Jalmoker is the ambassador of Global Health uh, here in Sweden. And uh, welcome. We're happy to hear what you say. Will Sweden be able to maintain the role we've had uh, so far in funding? Will we still focus on battling HIV AIDS? Uh, do you have some sound? Oh, so let me, here's the microphone. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And thank you for inviting me here today. Very happy to be back in the business and very happy to meet many old and new friends here today. So thank you MSF for inviting me to this very important seminar. And I must say I'm very not only glad and happy, I'm honored to be here today. And uh, we also very much appreciate the good and close cooperation with MSF and many of other of you here in the room. Yes, I just came back from uh, Tanzania, where I was the Swedish ambassador for five years. But um, it was not in Tanzania, it was actually in Africa. I met in Kenya, <laughs> I met uh, HIV the first time, many, many years back. And that time it was a Swedish man. And he came up to my office one day and he said, Lennart, I'm going for a funeral in the US because a former partner of me have died from something. And they didn't even know the name of that illness, and that was in the early 80s, so it was very, very early. But since then, HIV has become something very important for me and something I very often come back to, and, and so on. Uh, I also worked for a number of years in New York in our UN mission, and during that time, Sweden was very much behind the establishment of UN AIDS, where we saw how the UN system did not work and we needed something more to work better on, 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 on uh, HIV. Back to Africa again, Tanzania, and uh, now I'm back in Sweden, back in, uh, in, in the sector again, as an ambassador for global health. And I'm succeeding Anders Nordström, that I know many of you know. And uh, in this capacity, I'm very much engaged in, on the board of UNAIDS, on the Global Fund, but also other organizations. Words to deeds, policies, strategies, and commitments. I was actually sitting uh, yesterday afternoon and put a number of small notes together and headings and Tobias and 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 uh, uh, Kerstin, you have already touched upon a lot of this, so I will uh, jump a little bit around. But words into deeds, I think this is uh, strategic and very important. Um, 
It's very relevant from rhetoric to action. This is something I strongly believe in to move words into deeds, to make policies, strategies, statements and commitments becoming reality in people's real life. And uh, this being said, I strongly believe in policies and strategies. I believe in commitments. I believe in documents because those who sign up to these documents, those are the ones we can keep to stay accountable to what they have promised. So this link about policy, strategies, commitments, but also to follow up on what has been promised. A lot has happened. When I have taken part the last weeks in board meetings of UNAIDS and the Global Fund, but also listening to, to the two of you today, it is fantastic to see how much that has happened. 15 million people on treatment today. I remember the debate when I became the HIV and AIDS ambassador in 2003 and when WHO launched the initiative 3 by 5 how many doctors who said this is not possible and how many activists that said this is too little. So, um, and, uh, but we saw how important that initiative was and today we see that we are far beyond that 3 by 5 We have three, five, 15 million people on treatment. But still reminding us about that this is not good enough. Um, we need more people on treatment and we need many, many more people to be targets for prevention. We must halt the spread. We see more than 2 million new infections every year. Uh, very important that we remember to celebrate or to be happy about what we have achieved, but also to see what are the needs for the future. Uh, I think the world leaders, uh, you challenged me, moderator, about what about Sweden will do. I will come to that a little bit. But we have seen how the world leaders have uh, realized that something must be done. And uh, I was very much part of the MDGs and the work on the MDGs. And we were happy about the three goals related to health. Uh, now we see many more goals, and I very much agree with, uh, with Tobias when you say that almost all of them are very relevant for health. And that is important because I meet people, I have met people the last months who say there's only one out of 17 goals related to health. And I say, please go back home and read the goals again and tell me what goals are not relevant for health. So. Uh, this is important with the sustainable development goals and also the commitment in the goals and uh, leaving no one behind. And when I last night read the political declaration once again, and I see in that political declaration on Agenda 2030 that we embark on this great collective journey, we pledge that no one will be left behind. The world leaders met and they say we pledge that no one will be left behind. Let's keep them to stay accountable to that. Uh, then we know that uh, the agenda was operationalized in the 17 goals and also the 169 targets. And we have already heard about the target 3.3, goal number 3, target 3.3, that says that by 2030 end the epidemic of AIDS, tuberculosis, malaria and other communicable diseases to end. Uh, in the previous goals we heard about to halt and to reverse and we heard directions. Here we hear a very good word to end. I think that is a very important uh, way there. Following the SDGs, following the SDGs we have uh, been agreeing to strategies in the UNAIDS and in the Global Fund. Very forceful strategies. And I, I did find it so exciting to be at the UNAIDS board meeting. The first agency, the first organization, the first joint program that met after the SDGs and to see how it was so clear by all member states that this is something we have to move forward on. When I became the AIDS ambassador in 2003, we still discussed quite a lot prevention or treatment. And I remembered a little bit uh, about old times in development when we talked about aid or trade, or trade and aid, or aid for trade, and different combinations. And uh, I felt there was a little bit the same discussion here about prevention or treatment. But uh, when, uh, when I read and when I listen to Michel CDB when he opened the UNAIDS board meeting, and I will quote him here when he said, treatment and prevention go hand in hand, their combined impact is, in, uh, is enormous and is changing lives for better. But still life-saving medicines are not reaching a large segment of the world's people and the future of the AIDS response will depend on whether the world can act together to reduce the number of new infections. So this very clear message on working together. 
Not so much. A little bit has been said about human rights. I will use a few minutes to say that. I started. I have my watch here. <laughs> uh, we were a little bit late when I started. Uh, the fight against HIV and AIDS clearly, clearly shows the necessity to secure the full respect for all human rights. And I'm reading from my, my script here because I think this is important. All human rights for all people. This is relevant for women and men, boys and girls. There should be no limitation based on gender, on sexual orientation or any other aspect of life. The right not to be subject to stigma and discrimination is crucial. The president of MSF, there. <laughs> Thank you for opening the meeting today. You touched upon that, stigma and discrimination. The right not to be subject to stigma and discrimination is crucial. And there must be an end to sexual violence, of course. So. Uh, the full respect for all human rights also means to reach the young people, in particular young girls, that we know are more exposed to HIV than young boys. We know that 71% of new infections in Sub-Saharan Africa are among adolescent girls. And also special efforts must be made to address gender inequalities and discrimination among young women and girls. But this is not only about women and girls. And very often when I talk about this, I'm one of the few who talk about the boys and the men that both beliefs and behavior of very many boys and men must change. So we must also, I would say, empower the boys and men to dare to change. But in all the overall on, on, keep, on, on what I touched upon on human rights, we talk about key populations of very often. Tobias, you talked about men of sex with men, you talked about injecting drug users, about men and women who sell and buy sex, and so on. I mean, these key populations must be reached, must be seen, their voices must be heard, they must be part of the overall fight against the pandemic. Now well, I am on my last page. <laughs> the um, UNAID strategy, coming back to that one again, and even if I talked so much about treatment and prevention go hand in hand, the UNAID strategy is a lot about prevention, how to halt the spread of the infection, how to stop the two million new infections per year. The message is clear, there is a need to instill new energy in HIV prevention. What I also in very short would like to say here is that we must, based on priorities, based on evidence and on context. Context very important. Accelerator crash, UNAIDS talk a lot about. The five years of the window of opportunity you talked about. I don't need to spend a lot of time on that. I also believe it's a crucial point in time right now to see how to handle it for the coming five years. Finally, all actors are needed, act as one. I see Pia here, Pia Engstrand from CEDA. You will talk later on today. I see Lotta Roos also from CEDA, maybe others. Uh, we uh, did produce a small script some years back all actors are needed, but we need to act as one. We need all actors, big and small, international, national, private, public, but we must go in the same direction. We must believe in evidence and all that. So all actors are needed. And then it comes to who will pay. Kerstin, you are a good activist. <laughs> Thank you for reminding us about the needs, about what is needed. Uh, and thank you both of you for commenting upon domestic responsibilities, because that is also important. Because when we talk about how, who will pay, it is about both national and international. It is about small and big. It is about business. I think we should see much more coming from the private sector, from business. Uh, Sweden has been and will continue to be an important actor in this field. And uh, uh, I could have started by talking about the 850 million we disperse to the Global Fund this year, the 200 million we disperse for UNAIDS this year. But I didn't do that because, like Kerstin said, we are also embarking on a new process on replenishments and we are looking into the future. So I'm sure you will continue to hear from Sweden also in that perspective. But let me also say that money, money is not all. Many of these things is about how to change. It's about dialogue, it's about advocacy, it's, it's about how to deal with government, how to deal with other actors. And uh, it is important to be able to combine this money part and the other part. And Sweden will continue to do that and I will be part of that. So uh, 
that was 16 minutes <laughs> and I had 15. Uh, I will stop here, um, but I will also say once again say thank you to MSF for organizing this. Thank you to the president of MSF up there. When Mark Deipel, the head of Global Fund, was here, and Michelle Sidibe, the head of UNAIDS, were here a month back. We met them in different fora, and uh, our state secretary organized the lunch, and we were very happy that the president of MSF was there, and we had a good dialogue on that. Two weeks ago, when I went to Geneva for the board meeting of the Global Fund, I met Kerstin all the time in the corridors, and you did your advocacy, lobbyist work there. And uh, I think, I want to give credit, not only to MSF, but to very many of you from civil society. You play an extremely important role. From the public side, we will also continue to play what we believe is an important role. Thank you. Thank you. I think you can take the microphone with you and let me see where your sign is next to Tobias. And uh, could I just ask you one very brief <coughs> question before the next speaker comes? Because as you mentioned, you used to be the ambassador for HIV AIDS. Now you are the ambassador for global health. Does that indicate a change in focus from the government or why? Or how should we interpret that? Uh, <laughs> strength and systems for health. That was one of my sm short points. I, I didn't have the time to touch upon. Thank you for the question. Now, already during the last years when I was the ambassador for HIV, I felt it, it was somewhat difficult to see upon one disease against another one. HIV, malaria, TB, diarrhea, whatever. I think we should be able to handle the global agenda and the health agenda in a broad sense. And to do that, I think we need stronger health systems. And uh, so it's not a shift in policy, I would say, but it, it is something that we strongly believe in and that I, I'm not a medical doctor like many of you, I'm a political scientist and economist, but uh, I believe that it is important that we can look upon HIV as part of the broader health agenda. That does not mean that we don't look upon it as very, very, very important. I liked what Michel CDB said here, and I don't know if I should quote somebody he quoted and so on. <laughs> but uh, I liked when he said, uh, when a former minister for um, uh, health in an African country said, well, I was not really a minister for health. I was a minister for some public hospitals. So I think this about strength and systems for health is important, and the community level that already was talked about. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I just want to tell you about when I first started to work as a correspondent in Africa. Uh, I came to South Africa in 2002 when, when uh, Thabo Mbeki was still the president and was denying a lot of people access to ARVs. I think the very first AIDS story I did in Africa was actually where I interviewed one of the Bongile Chabalala's uh, colleagues uh, from the TAC. I remember that Saki Ahmed at the time, I think, was still not taking ARVs himself, just to as a gesture of uh, s uh, solidarity with all the millions that weren't giving access to ARVs. I think your struggle within the treatment action campaign in South Africa was crucial for what we see now with many people having access to ARVs. And I really want to welcome you, Sibongile Chabalala. Uh, and uh, you're going to talk to us a bit about the challenges of HIV AIDS in South Africa prior and after accessing ARVs. Welcome. <coughs> Thank you, Caroline. Um, I'm not good with technology, but hope it, it will assist. Yes. Day. Uh, you see, I stuck. However, um, as I, I, I would like to start by thanking MSF for organizing this seminar. I'm one of the people who are living with HIV openly, and uh, the, the, my presentation I wanted to, to show, but I can't. Can one, anyone assist? Yes. Yeah, I'm one of uh, people who are living with HIV. Uh, and from 2000, 
I was diagnosed in year 2000 on the 31st of October. And by that time, I was very sick. <clears throat> and at that time, there was no treatment in South Africa. So the hope for living was very little. And the struggle was a bit high at, at, about ti at, at, at that time. And I didn't know anything about this HIV. And it was just a disease that I had somebody talking about. I didn't have information about HIV by then. But uh, <clears throat> uh, because of the some family support that I had, I'm still alive. I'll start by saying that. And I will start by thanking my mom, although she's not here, because she's the person. She's the first person I disclosed my, my status to her. And she was very positive. So where do I press? Oh, OK. Um, as I've said, uh, HIV was uh, 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 it was very critical in, in our country. Uh, many people were dying of HIV. These are the statistics that uh, are, are for, uh, uh, were, were estimated in 2004. A lot of women were infected by HIV, and I won't I won't state all the all, all the all the all the statistics because of time. I'm trying to rush. My th my, my presentation is very long. As <laughs> As Caroline said, uh, there was no political will in South Africa. As we all know, maybe, that Tabon Pegu was a denialist with Manto Chawalalam Simang. And, you know, with HIV, they said you must eat garlic and you must eat a lot of beetroot and a lot of, fruit, uh, uh, of, uh, of vegetables. Just imagine, you are HIV positive with a CD4 count of 168, and by that time, you are very sick. That's me. <coughs> And you are, you, are, you, are, you are advised to take a lot of garlic. You are advised to take a lot of beetroot. What will happen to, your, to, your, to, to your, uh, uh, your stomach? You'll go to the toilet every day and until you die because of uh, beetroot. And then in 2010, <coughs> in, in 1998, 10 December, uh, ANC was launched uh, by Zaki Ahmad and his 10 friends. Uh, as Caroline has stated that at that time, Zaki uh, decided not to take his treatment uh, to I I in solidarity with us, who were not able to afford treatment at that time, because that time treatment was very uh, expensive. So for a person like me, who's coming from, from a, very, uh, a very bad background, uh, with apartheid, and you know, with the, with, with, the, with the family that is not uh, uh, financially stable to buy ARVs for me every month. At that time, it was about 3,000 a month for a one-month period uh, a treatment. So by that time, that means all my dad's salary will go to treatment. So the family won't have anything to live on. And <clears throat> shortly after that, and the discrimination and stigma was very bad because some of people were, die, were, were killed because uh, uh, they are HIV positive. One of them is Kukulamini, and she, uh, she was stoned to death because she, oh, she, 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 she spoke open with her HIV uh, status. That's why we are having T-shirts like this, to fight a stigma uh, uh, against people who are living with HIV in South Africa. And tech in 2001, 2001, they started to litigate against the government and uh, pharmaceutical companies, companies where we were fighting for AZT to be, <coughs> to be available. The, the pharmaceutical companies were taking advantage of the situation because by that time, uh, women who, who are pregnant were not getting anything from, to prevent their children from getting HIV. And by that time, a lot of kids who were born at that time are HIV positive, of which this time are out, uh, some of them are, uh, are teenagers, of which I'll get to that to, uh, later in my presentation. And uh, 2002 to 2003, Hazel Tao uh, launched a complaint against uh, over excessive ARVs. ARVs were very expensive, ever, as, as I stated earlier. <coughs> in 2003, at TAC, we launched a civil disobedience where we were forcing our government to provide ARVs to public hospitals and everyone must access uh, 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 ARVs. And at that time, everything was, you know, everyone was, every, uh, 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 a funeral business was like, 
emerging every every corner of the country because people were more attending uh, funerals than attending merry uh, uh, weddings and parties and everything so every day in south africa people were were buried because of hiv <coughs> um these are the campaigns that we 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 we, we dealt with as a treatment action campaign of which i won't uh, mention most of them but i would like to uh, take out the, the, this one of 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 fluconazole of which we were engaged in this with msf msf uh, assisted uh, tac to 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 to, to struggle a, a, a fluconazone from Thailand to, to South Africa, so that we'll be able to show our government that uh, trash is killing most of people who are living with HIV, and there is cheaper medicine that we'll be able to buy, uh, they, they can buy out of South Africa, because at that time, patent laws were given um, pharmaceutical companies licensing to, for, for, for them to, 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 to price uh, medication, especially fluconazone, at their price, and it was very expensive. <coughs> Uh, 5.5 million in South Africa living with HIV. That's a big number of people who are living with HIV. And later statistics are showing that 1.7 thousand, 1,700 people AIDS related deaths each day, of which uh, politicians are saying, yeah, we are getting there, it's now it's lower than before. But for us, one is too many. We cannot lose people uh, because of a a HIV and AIDS related death while we have treatment in our country. So it means there's something that we are not doing right. <coughs> I don't like this. <laughs> Actually, uh, what what is happening now in our country is that as much as we are we are we are having treatment and 2.3.2 million people are on treatment uh, there's still a lot that is happening self stigma is still uh, uh, reported although we are doing great on PM mtct of which it's matter to child prevention uh, we are doing very great it's about 1.6 uh, uh, per week so it means that a lot of children are not uh, born with hiv now because of the preventative tools that we have uh, we have a challenge especially of young women uh, our, our, uh leonard has spoke about engaging boys and men of which that's the point i liked mostly because women are not sleeping alone to be infected with hiv so there are boys and men in between in south africa we are having estimated 2363 young women who are, who are infected with HIV. So where is the problem? That means we are losing it. While Rwanda, it's, it's having at least 25 women who are, who, are infected, who are infected with HIV per week. So what is South Africa doing wrong? Or, or what can we learn from Rwanda? What is happening in Rwanda? What is not happening in South Africa? Uh, exter external stigma is moderate. We still have cases of stigmatization from families, from uh, communities and everywhere, but it's not as it was before. But then the self-stigma is still high in our country, where people still feel don't confident about being HIV positive. They, they can't even say the name HIV because of the self-stigma. You know, they'll just say the disease that I have, and some will hide uh, 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 behind a uh, diabetic, some will hide, will, will, will hide, will hide behind a uh, uh, high blood pressure and all those things, pneumonia and all those, those, those diseases. But to be honest, we are still far behind. She's, she's up. <laughs> <laughs> well, which I don't like it. Then, <laughs> one of the, the campaigns that we have is the stop, stop, stock out, of which it makes us wonder how are we going to, we, we, how are we going to reach the 1990 targets as South Africa? We still have a lot of stakeouts in 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 our country. Uh, health system is declining in most areas like Free State, in Pumalanga, Northwest and Eastern Cape, uh, Northwest and Eastern Cape. And, and, and Northern Cape, that's where TAC is not there. And we are seeing a lot of challenges there. 
intellectual property as i spoke about the medication is still the challenge because the licensing is still monopoly it's mean it's still it's still given to 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 some uh companies of which they're monopolizing that government centers of power of the pro is still the problem because our minister of health is very passionate about hiv and is very passionate in fighting uh, hiv but the challenge is the uh, provincial emissions uh, that are not responding well to HIV and the cadre deployment is one of the factors that makes them not to respond well to HIV. Thank you. This is the match I was leading. Thank you very much, Shivangila. And I hope I wasn't stressing you too much. <laughs> So we're going to have a short panel debate here. Uh, we are running a little bit behind schedule, but not too bad. I'm going to take five minutes off the break. And I hope that's fine with everyone. <laughs> and uh, I would like you to start with the question, because what you, you presented, Sibangile, figures of showing how, how uh, health service was ac is actually declining in some South African states, uh, or Mpumalanga, Eastern Cape areas that we know are very badly uh, affected by HIV and AIDS. And at the same time, we heard Shashtin talking about this window of opportunity that I really want us, want, want us <coughs> to stay with in our discussions during the day, because I think that is quite amazing that we do have a window of opportunity now. But how must we work with it? Leonard said money is not all. Uh, but I think money is also needed. Justin, do you want to start on this? What, what, what's needed to be done now? Yeah, I think that one should work. And if the two, of the two men share the microphone, okay. I think that one should work. Okay, I'll, I'll try this, yes. Okay. Um, now, I think uh, it's important to, of course, only money will not be enough, but it's a definitely a prerequisite for moving forward. And I think it's also interesting if you look at the financial arguments and it's UNAIDS is making the case that we are actually, uh, uh, re we, we can reach the tipping point if we invest now. And But there's also the argument of actually within five years, if we get ahead, of, if we move forward now, we are actually able to bend the curve and that should be the strongest argument. Um, and uh, normally we're struggling as advocates with very long-term, very long, far-sighted um, uh, plans and objectives to, to, to convince politicians that it makes sense to invest. But I think this is the five-year window should be, uh, it's a one-time opportunity, they say. What kind of actions would you like to see from Sweden, for example, now? Well, one concrete action, of course, in terms of funding would be the Global Fund Replenishment coming up next year. Um, but also, um, yeah, making the case that donor funding, donor investments is still very much needed. I think indeed domestic financing is important, but I, it's in, it's, it, I think the we really need to insist that both will be continue to be needed. We're look at looking at these very low coverage rates in, in, in countries um, that are risking to lag even further behind. They will not be able to finance their own response in the near future. Lana, do you want to respond on that? I fully agree, of course, that money is needed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, what I said is that money is not all. And, and I think it is so important to, to be able to, to see where the money will be best used. And if we talk about prevention in particular, that most of the time does not cost that much. It's, it's about behavior, it's about the message, it's about how to do things, and it's about openness and all that. So, uh, but money is definitely needed, and uh, and uh, then you come to the question where to put the money, and, and some of us, we well, all of us, I think, have listened to Hans Rosling, <laughs> but uh, some weeks ago at the Karolinska, there was a global health night, and he showed what does the world look like? Seven billion people in the world, one billion rich from the rich side and, and wealthy side, and one billion the poor, and five billion in the middle the middle income countries. And uh, if you divide that one into two, lower middle income and higher middle income, it becomes even more challenging. And if you see where are the broad uh, appearance of, uh, of uh, uh, HIV and, and other communicable diseases, it is in the low income and lower middle income. And 
what does that mean? How you use ODA money and so on. So there are a number of things that must be addressed. I'm not saying that money is not needed. Money is definitely needed. But talking about money, what yeah. is the will or the aim now from the Swedish government? Will we keep up our funding or what does it look like? Well, I, I think you and all of you know that I'm not in a position to, to comment upon that. I mean, we are going to meet in Japan in a few weeks time for the first meeting on the replenishment of the Global Fund. That is the first step in a process. And where you look upon once again, even more, what, where are the needs, what has worked, where are the evidences, what are the results and so on. But also uh, to see the replenishment based on the strategy just being adopted in the, in the Global Fund. We see a, quite a big poverty focus in the Global Fund that Sweden applauds because we think that <coughs> is important. That being said, we also see the needs in other parts uh, of, of the world, so to say, but no, I'm, I'm not to comment on what Sweden can do for the future. I, that's a political process and that's a process that will come later on. Thanks. Tobias, you told us about the map, uh, like how, how the infection rates in different parts of the world looks like now. What kind of actions would you like to see? I think it's very important to really acknowledge that now we have the SDGs, the MDGs, there were before, and I still hear quite a lot in global health that for the MDGs, global health was more prominent there, we sh saw it better there, but I really believe what you said, Lena, there, that in the SDGs, there is so much global health, we just put it out and take it out there and show it. And again, for all the investments in HIV, I think it's very important to show that these were not just investments in HIV, it also led to better health systems, it led to reductions in many other illnesses, and show the beneficial effects from that. And the same way around that if we invest in health systems, it's also an investment in the AIDS response. And again, I think it's very good that now we don't have an ambassador for HIV AIDS, but for global health, and show that again as a positive example. And again, I think in the coming months, years, it's really, really important to get a couple of good stories where you can show if you invest correctly and invest, because you need the money, but you need to invest it correctly where the epidemic really is, and then you get the results and you use this. And if you get good examples, again, then you can use it, but we can just not continue like we did before and say, we need more money, we need this. No, it will be different, very, very different world. And I think we have to acknowledge that and work together. Sibongile, what would you say is needed in uh, in South Africa, in the worst affected areas, or what what kind of actions would you like to see fr from the outside world? Um, <coughs> to be honestly, uh, because uh, as I've said earlier, that uh, in our country there's e there is a pol uh, cadre deployment of which we are seeing more of MECs and you know, uh, uh, MMCs of health in our country are not there because they are passionate or they have no, they, there's no political will. So uh, uh, civil society, it's more needed in, in, in our country. And if we can see a more responsive of civil society, that will assist a uh, politician to be, hold, to be held accountable and to to drive them in the in the, in the, in a positive direction where they'd be able to respond to the issues that are, are supposed to to respond to uh, unfortunately there are a lot of civil society organization in our country of which most of them are funded by our, by, by 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 our government of which that takes them takes away the privilege of um, pushing the government, you know, as treatment action campaign, we're not taking money from our government. Why? Because we still need that independence for 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 our organisation, and that will make us be able to 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 say whatever we want to to say or to criticize our government as much as we want to criticize where it's necessary. And that is why Treatment Action Campaign in South Africa is still the one organization that can be able to hold our government accountable. And that's the one organization that our government will not want to get on the wrong side of Treatment Action Campaign. That keep them on their toes, not because we are anti-government, but is to keep them on their toes and to provide services to people who need services. Thank you. And just one final question to you, Shastin. What if we fail to use this window of opportunity that we have now? <laughs> well, I, 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 I would rather not talk about the financial consequences, but of course UNAIDS is, is, um, has some quite s daunting figures of, of in terms of what it will cost in the long term, but I think it's more a matter of what the opportunity we actually have to bend the curves and, and the, 
the the cost of lives that that we would save uh, by by not missing this opportunity. And it's a five year opportunity from now on, would yeah, you I mean, say? Or I mean, according to UNAIDS, this is mm. there's this is the strategy that the world has agreed to, and I think. Uh, the 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 front loading of investment is a is a core part of that, but of course the implementation challenges that needs to be and, and sim simplified approaches to uh, to response will be essential, and and I think the the rest of the day we'll talk about that. So. We will. Um, Sibongile will also be in the panel debate later on this afternoon, and before we take a break. Uh, we're going to have a few minutes of reflection, uh, which is going to be presented to us by Ophelia Hanyama, and, uh, who is an HIV AIDS activist and senior advisor at Noax Arc. So just a few minutes, and then we'll go for a break. And please be back here at 10.55, 5 to 11. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I actually went through the list. You know, I was looking at who is actually here. To be honest, everyone who is here knows a lot about HIV. So we're not talking to anyone else. Mm -hmm. We are still doing the old, little, old message for 30 years. We have no one new. We are not innovative enough. We are complaining about the money is limited. Yes, it is from these same people you're asking the money from. Try to change the way you think. I have lived with HIV for more than 30 years. Mm. And everyone in this room, most of them that have been working with HIV, I know them since then. It's about time we attract other people that have money. It's about time you, you actually relate HIV to business. My mother lives 40 kilometers away from the nearest running water, the nearest town, but she has an Ericsson phone. My, my auntie, who is HIV positive, she also lives 50 kilometers away from the nearest clinic. She has an Ericsson phone. Don't you think that inviting Ericsson here would be an, a good idea? Because mm. actually, the more people that leave, the more money Ericsson makes. Mm. The more people that leave, the more money Atlas Copco makes. Exactly. They actually provide clean water for all. Mm. To take medicine in Africa, I'm African, I'm from Zambia. You either die from the drugs or you die from dirty water. Mm. So Atlas Copco should be here. And People walk. The only reason Sweden is developed because you have time. You have time to think. You have time to be innovative. Or the only thing you do in the morning, you know, to take a shower, it takes you two minutes, doesn't it? You get out of bed, you go down to your bathroom, you turn on the water, and it's coming down. And you get out and you go to work. To take a shower in my village takes you two hours. Mm. First, you have to find the firewood if you want hot water. Mm. Then you have to have a matches to put the firewood on. That's another development issue. Then you have to walk 10 kilometers away, maybe, to bring the water that you're going to boil so you can take a shower. So when do you have time to innovate and change? So be realistic. Stop living in this. Because uh, uh, I, I know I've lived here too, so I appreciate living in Sweden. I've lived in Africa. I appreciate that too. People walk. Swallowing the tablets is the easiest. Anyone can do that. But if you are going to take the pill for the rest of your life, and you have to walk five hours every month to pick it up, motivate me doing that for 40 years. Mm. I won't. Mm. I have too many other pressing issues. I have children that have to go to school. Exactly. I have goals that I have to actually put work every day. To walk four hours or five hours every month is 10 hours per week. You're not doing anything. You are not producing anything. You are just working. To live one more year, to live two more years. How many Swedes would do that, honestly? I refuse to walk to, s to my hospital. It's about 15 minutes even, if I wanted to. But if they moved me to another hospital that is further out, like Houdinge, I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. By train. Not walking, by train. And I need to go there only once a year, and I'll still complain. So I think, according to what you said, I think there's a picture, that one. I'm completely too tired to walk, bring the medication to the people. Any human being has enough brain, has enough hope to want to live longer. Be African. 
It's not that I like to be in Sweden, to be honest. It's too cold. <laughs> but my choice is to go back to my village with HIV and walk five kilo or 40 kilometers every month. I'll stay here. So please, you experts, <coughs> find other financing people. Stop complaining. Get a life. If there is a cure, we won't meet again. So let's not have one. Because most of you here are living on it, including me, living on HIV. Trust me. I want a cure personally, but financially I don't. Because <laughs> I won't have a job. <laughs> so I would rather, hopefully, the whole day when we are sitting, because I have to leave. And the other thing about human rights, you know, Sweden is fantastic. However, if you're a woman living with HIV in Sweden, you have fertility issues. You need to have IVF. The Swedes won't give it to you. We are very civilized people. But IVF for a woman? Uh-uh. No one wants to take responsibility for that. I mean, we are lag gum people. You know, we're like, have you interdicted it? Canada started doing that in 2002. Down the road in Denmark, you can have it done if you're under 40. But here, hmm. So where are my reproductive lives here, Leonard? So on that, I think you spend your day. I'm off to Poland for another company which is not sitting here at all, for H&M. They do give money for HIV, so try that. Mark Foundation, go there, stop complaining. Be more innovative. The disease is here to stay, and thank you. Thank you, Felia, and thank you, the panel, for your interesting speeches. And please go out, have some coffee, go to the bathroom, and we'll see you here at 5 to 11.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Please take your seats. Uh, we talk We've spoken a little bit more generally about the situation and the current struggle against HIV AIDS. Now we're going to focus a bit more on South Africa and uh, also on the on uh, the system to work with lay councillors in uh, trying to get the ARTs out and to make people take their pills in the right way. And for all of you who maybe are not so familiar with what lay councillors are, get your popcorns ready. We're going to start with watching a short film. <laughs> Should we try again or? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Sorry? Oh, okay. Because it's beautiful footage from Kusul Natal, so should we should. Maybe this? No? Yeah, <laughs> there must always be some problems with the uh, technical stuff, otherwise it's not a true seminar. So let's see again if we can get the correct sound.
I'm sorry about the problem with the sound. Uh, there is... Um, let me see if... Yeah. Um, this film is available on YouTube with the right, with the correct sound. So if any of you are keen, you can watch <laughs> it during the lunch break later on. Uh, it's about the work of the lay councillors in the Eshove project in KwaZulu Natal. And the lay councillors are the local health workers that help people uh, with, with support to make them take the ARTs. <laughs> and we were talking before the break about can we do more with less? Can we how to not leave anyone behind? How to get everyone aboard? And uh, I think uh, this, um, uh, the work of lay councillors is maybe one way to move this forward. And Mark Byatt, who is the operational director for MSF in Southern Africa, will tell us more on how this works and what you found in the project you've done in KZN. Welcome. And you will have 20 minutes. Yes, thank yeah. you, yeah, because <laughs> I, I wanted to already apologize. Okay. I'm a terrible timekeeper, but they gave me 20 minutes, so I will take my time. But please shout if it's getting too long. <laughs> Raise up. Um, so thank you very much for organizing this, uh, this meeting, this workshop uh, today. Indeed, I think it's thanks to the, the Swedish um, uh, post code lottery, if, sorry for my pronunciation of Swedish, that we are able to, to join here because that was one of their recommendations as well to create an event with the civil society in Sweden and I think it's very important that we as MSF can witness what happens on the field and what uh, we can bring this out towards the uh, public in western uh, or northern countries uh, to try to also create that solidarity link. And as I used to say, um, when people ask me why I do work with MSF now since uh, 1989, it's also because I think MSF, well, I, I consider that we are working with our feet in the mud, but we have our head in the stars. So, and I think there's always this kind of witnessing of MSF that we try to bring from what we feel and see in the field, usually at patient level and at the lowest level of the nurses that usually don't make policy, but who are crushed by, by all the rules and regulations from donors to gov from and governments towards their own reality, and that they have a little voice only in that whole game. While we try just to bring that up, to voice that out, and to try to see if we can help them, patients and healthcare workers, in their daily fight. So, and I'm very pleased and honored to bring uh, this presentation for you. And then just, I think it's this one. Yes, indeed. So um, MSF started in 2011 with a project in KwaZulu-Natal. KwaZulu-Natal is that uh, eastern province in uh, South Africa, uh, where also with a capital um, maybe less known, but, but the biggest city is Durban, the big port, the international port, of course, on the... Um, uh, on the um, yeah, Indian Ocean, yes indeed, sorry. <laughs> and so basically, uh, KwaZulu-Natal, why? Well, because it has, I think, the biggest prevalence of HIV uh, in South Africa, and probably also of the world. Over 30% of the adult population is infected by HIV. Program was designed after that in um, 2010, some statistics and papers, interesting papers showed that we could start looking at treatment as a prevention mean. By putting more and more people on treatment, we could also aim at preventing the spread of the disease. So that's why this uh, project is, all is also called uh, bending the curves, bending the curves of the incidence of the prevalence of HIV and also of course of the morbidities or comorbidities due to HIV. And basically, we cater for something like 180,000 people, tra work around uh, eight health centers and two hospitals. And so we are specifically focused on in Umlalanzi district and uh, Ishowe uh, and Bongolwani district, sorry, uh, municipality of Umlalanzi and the district of um, Bongolwani and uh, Ishowe. In 2013, one and a half year after um, we had started, we could finally also have the first results of a survey that we did in uh, 2013, thanks to MSF and Epicentre and the government, of course, Minister of Health of uh, uh, South Africa. It was a um, study that looked at the HIV incidence and also the ART coverage, trying to understand the population you work with. 
I heard already several times today as well, we should look at the key populations, we should work smarter. Tobias spoke about uh, the interesting word smarter. And he reflected already that there are some regions that should be focused on more specifically, or it's groups of people that should be focused more specifically, like sex workers or prisoners or, or migrant people and so on. But we realized some interesting uh, issues here as well, that in the big bulk of Tobias' slides, on a certain moment, Tobias showed that the general population still is probably something like over 50% of the people that we need to look for. Well, still in there, there are major differences according to uh, the, the pattern of the per well, the, 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 the lifestyle of the person, but also the, the age of the person. And that is, I think, what one, one of the biggest, um, how would I say, findings in that survey. So it was s or more or less 6,000 people that were interviewed. And so we tried to get a grip on what's happening around here. Um, so what did we see? Well, we first saw that 25% overall HIV prevalence, so one on four of the adults are HIV positives. We have a quite already a big difference, of course, between male and female, as uh, women were double as infected as uh, men. And unfortunately, what we also saw is that in the age group 25 to 39 years old, you have a topping up of the HIV prevalence among women, up to 60% of the young women between 25 and 39 years old were HIV po are HIV positive. Interestingly as well, you can see that as from uh, 15 years onwards to uh, 29 years old, this is going to climb quite steeply. Probably here explained because that's the end of the secondary school and then gradually climbing up and probably as well here around childbearing age or at least yeah, the, the first children are coming up and the infection rate is indeed uh, steepingly increasing. So indeed we see that uh, maybe we've done already a lot but we are maybe missing out some, some important uh, parts of the population. Looking at these HIV positive people, we differentiated them between the ones that were aware of their HIV status and the ones that were not aware of this HIV status. And for example, again, looking at the group 20 to 29, you can see that the young woman here, nearly half of them is not aware of their uh, HIV status. I'm sorry, the, um, so this is not aware. Some, some parts of the slides have disappeared, unfortunately. Um, and so basically what we even realize here, although in lesser numbers, but the majority of the young men are not aware of the HIV status. Something is going on here that uh, we need to urgently focus on. So when speaking about key populations, speaking about priorities, we decided that this should be a priority, focusing on the younger age groups, focusing on the women, but also certainly not like it was interestingly also said this morning already, focusing on the men, because also the men are escaping. Looking then at the people that are HIV positives, how many are already on ART, antiretroviral treatment, so the coverage of the treatment. So we can see here that basically, well, uh, an interesting part, as the older we are, an interesting part of the population is indeed under antiretroviral treatment of those who are HIV positives. Again, we are missing out the younger age group because we can see that the majority of the women and the men that are young um, are in fact not yet covered by antiretroviral treatments. So basically blue is the one that are under ART, the other colors are the one that are not yet under ART but HIV positive. And again here, and sorry again for the, the graphics because um, that I think it's changed with <laughs> the presentation. Uh, basically here you can see that these are the people with an immunity uh, less, with a CD4 immunity less than 350. The ones that are uh, under 500 are up to here and the one above 500 are up to here. So for the insiders, the people who know a little bit of, of the WHO guidelines, and basically until 2013, we uh, were focusing mainly on the people with a threshold less than 350, but basically we were missing still this whole part of the population that was not allowed to start treatment. In 2013, we decided with WHO that we should, um, I would say, no, sorry, uh, 2000. Um, yeah, 13, we should aim at uh, inclusion criteria of uh, CD4-500 uh, that should be including these people. But still again, we saw that or we can see that we would still 
uh, lose quite a lot of uh, people that uh, that would escape a treatment because of this. And happily now we know that well tomorrow onwards uh, officially it will also be recommended now in the new WHO guidelines for 2015 that we should start treatment as early as possible. This means that we will finally also be able to include all this big number of people in the yellow bars that are having still a quite good immunity, therefore also are probably more economically but also sexually active and are the ones that are the core in factors in, in, in sp for spreading the epidemic. Looking at the pri program, wha what, what does it mean now for MSF or other partners to, to work in an HIV program? Yes, we do focus on prevention, but unfortunately prevention is something, we'll speak a bit, a bit more in details, is something that we, we tend to, to, to forget a little bit too easily. And unfortunately also, triple 90 doesn't include prevention activities. We speak about the testing, the treatment, the linkage to care, the adherence issue. We ha don't have a fourth 90 that would be tackling the prevention issues. Um, so we are indeed trying to test the people. We are, and that is one of the biggest bottlenecks as well, is to try to link the people that have been HIV tested, HIV positively tested, that they should start treatment. They should be brought to the clinic and start treatment. And then when they are brought to the clinic, they should accept to start the treatment. This is also a thing. And then th another problem is to try to retain them in care. It means that they have to come, like it was said already, or monthly, or maybe now, happily, we can already have schemes of trimesterly coming to the health centers and retained in care. But that also does not mean that they will day by day, on the same hour, take their pills. I'm a medically trained person. I have had five, six years long uh, to swallow anti-epileptic pills. And I can, I can now know as well that it is very hard, even with all my background, medical background, very hard to oblige myself to take that damn pill every day. Um, so, and that is indeed where the challenge lies. The, 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 the problem is, is to help the people adhering daily to their treatment. It is possible, but we need to now direct our efforts to achieve so. So let's look at the prevention activities that we try to implement in KwaZulu-Natal project in uh, Umululazi district. And so indeed we assist the government as well with voluntary male circumcisions, because it's known that voluntary male circumcisions uh, or male circumcisions, circumcisions are able to decrease the risk of HIV infection by 62% for men. Not for women, of course, and so basically, indeed, we help the government. Um, oops, sorry, we help the government to um, circumcise the people, and the men are happily already up to one fifth of the adult age uh, circumcised. But quite some efforts still need to be done. Um, the next challenge, indeed, is about education of people, condomizing the people, of course, helping them to have easy access to condoms. But is that enough? When we see that in all these years that indeed education exists, that, counts, that uh, counseling exists, that uh, condoms are uh, readily present everywhere, still we can see the staggering number of women that are, or, or the new HIV infection, sorry, uh, yeah, among young women aged 15 to 24 years old in East and Southern Africa, of which the staggering high number in uh, South Africa of 2,363. And I'm pleased to see as well that it's the same number, I think, that Sibongili presented so happily. These are, uh, how would I say, uh, reconforting all well, uh, similar numbers. So South Africa is indeed facing that problem that education and condomization is not enough. So we are actively looking now in the years ahead to also look at PrEP and PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis, trying to see that when a person, mainly a woman of course, in a um, uh, certain specific time period of her uh, life is at extreme high risk of being infected, that she could then preventively take the treatment and by this uh, prevent the infection by uh, a huge percentage. So PrEP is taking antiretroviral treatment while you are still HIV negative and by this um, um, preventing you to get the treatment. So we're going to uh, start this uh, new innovative treatment uh, strategy uh, as from next year onwards. Linkage to care um, and testing the people. For years in the first decade, I think, of the HIV treatment, we were focusing on 
uh, testing the people when they arrive at the health center and usually when they were asking for treatment. We gradually realized that we also should go and actively test people even if they don't ask for treatment and they are very sick and we suspect HIV. We should also have the provider testing and, uh, treat and uh, testing and counseling the person. But we also realized that this was not enough and so we have to go for looking at them at the community. And so that is what we developed in um, three different strategies. We go for door-to-door -door testing, but we indeed only face a certain percentage of the population there because the majority of the people is working during uh, the daytime, of course. But still, we can uh, meet children, we can uh, meet uh, the mothers behind at home, and we indeed try to uh, focus on the testing uh, of these, this population, but that is not enough. So we need also to look at other sites, and the other sites are, for example, looking where the men are because the men they come back after four or five o'clock in the afternoon from work so where do they central centrally come they are centrally coming at the bus station so we should have fixed testing sites, uh, sites that are able to catch these men or these women that work on certain hours and that are uh, only free when the health center is closed another problem of course is that they have difficulty to go for the testing because if they would go for the testing they would probably lose a whole day and basically they will also lose this day salary because they are paid day by day. So trying to catch these people is also meaning go for them where they are. Adapt your strategies to the population that you are uh, facing. Same of course for, um, how would I say, other uh, activities in the communities according to what exists in your community. And then as well, looking at the farm workers, looking at taxi ranks, I already said this about through mobile testing, churches, other events, go and try to get to the people when they meet and the ones that usually are escaping the health center delivery services because they work, because they are at school or because they just don't feel sick. We are also considering actively to look into oral self-testing. That is a new device uh, that has now come out since uh, several years. Still quite expensive, but it is uh, very high, ha having a very high accuracy. And basically, we are definitely considering this as a potentiality to make people aware, have them testing with saliva, on their saliva, and then going with that HIV positive test on the saliva to the uh, health center to have a confirmation test on blood before that we can start the treatment. So we don't have lots of experience on that yet, but we are actively looking into that. And hopefully within a few years time, definitely we'll be able to add this up as another arrow on our bow. Um, Testing in the community, testing at health centers, uh, while well we could see indeed that basically we could increase in the last years uh, the testing quite tremendously, but this was mainly due to the, indeed, to the fact that uh, we had the community testing uh, picking up quite strongly. Unfortunately, KwaZulu-Natal, just like Lesotho um, in the neighboring country, um, is facing a big, sharp decline of number of uh, counselors for different reasons. Lesotho, because they don't have the money anymore. Um, and that is maybe one of the danger of mainstreaming HIV in uh, general healthcare provision is that, well, you are going to compete with other diseases and therefore counselors who care about counselors. We need nurses, we need doctors. And so why would we have to uh, favor or prioritize one disease above another? Well, we see indeed how much uh, indeed already this number of uh, counseling activities went down in the communities, in the facilities, sorry, and we can even see that better in the next slide, by which the number of counselors uh, is going to decrease from 32 up to 7, and we see that this has a direct uh, relationship with the number of con uh, counseling sessions that are performed and testing sessions that are performed in the, sim in the same uh, facilities. So basically, indeed, here we see that counselors are tremendously important, for which as well this uh, little film was, uh, I think, trying to highlight this uh, to the politicians and to the, 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 the donor uh, society uh, a few months ago. But basically as well, that it is also important that we need to have a specific focus on these kind of diseases that need specific, uh, uh, how would I say, uh, support, like counseling. You don't need counselors for malaria treatment, you need counseling for chronic treatments, just as TB, HIV, non-communicable diseases. And that's why we think that HIV still would need a specific attention uh, for, for these kind of uh, characteristics. Looking at the treatment and the retaining in care 
challenges we face on the, on the field. So basically, well, again here, sorry for the slide, some things uh, went down, but we can see indeed that when we started in 2011, by putting extra efforts, counselors, some extra clinicians going to the communities, we could quite steeply increase with the government the initiations of people on ART. And by adding up indeed, only in July 2014, we started by including people with a CD4 above 350, so between 500 and 350, we could start having a little, uh, how would I say, increase in the number of uh, testing of people that are uh, having a higher immunity uh, still. Unfortunately, it's these data are only until 2014 and that only, oops, that only represents uh, five months in the year. Um, the programmatic outcomes, indeed adherence is an issue, but we can still say that the majority of the people adheres well and is indeed remaining in care. So the remaining in care percentages are around 70 to 75 percent, which is quite comparable to other countries and not bad at all and encouraging, I would say. Loss to follow up indeed, the loss to follow up percentage are uh, related to that, of course, important. So we have to work on that. That is another priority for us. Dying has happily uh, not anymore occurred as strong as 15 years ago. And TFO is transfer outs, people that go for another health center. We also need here to have a special attention because um, people are moving where money is. People are moving for economical reasons. So we need to be able to have systems where we can guide these patients to start the treatment on one place and continue the treatment elsewhere. And that is one of the ways we try to do it as well, is for people that are mobile or for people that uh, also have been counseled and tested in the community, how can they uh, be linked for care and that we can encourage them to go for um, the, t the, the treatment. I know you stood up, but I will still continue quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I showed you that many people still don't access treatment and have a quite staggeringly high uh, or low CD4 count according to the, the statistics. And indeed, that's why we also have decided to go for a test and treat strategy that we would like to implement together with the government as from next year onwards, trying to tac tackle the number of people that don't access care yet. Challenges and adherence, I'm getting to it, don't worry. Uh, get so you heard already about the triple 90, the 90% 90 people need to be tested and uh, know their status, 90% of the people need to be put on treatment and 90% need to adhere. Unfortunately, we are still stylingly low, 55, 75 and 45% of the people are still not having an undetectable virus, uh, are only 45%, sorry, do have an undetectable viral load. What is the picture in, um, in KwaZulu-Natal, in the population where we are? Well, you can see that we are not too bad maybe in some uh, parts. So diagnosed, 82% of the people we expect are uh, diagnosed and 65% of the people do have a viral load under 1000, do have an undetectable viral load. But again, what do we see? There is an age difference. This is the bar above 30 years old. These are my adolescents, for example, as well. The younger population, the less than 30, which are m having much worse outcomes. And these are our priorities. These are our challenges. These are the key population that we need to focus on in our program um, uh, for the coming years. So how we do that? How do we do that? Community activities. I think I will let Sar uh, uh, explore more, much more on that, but it is an active part of our activities. Just like uh, I think Ophelia said this morning as well, let's be innovative. We have tried to be innovative and adapt treatments to the reality of the patients, bringing the treatment as close as possible to the people, but more details for that uh, on uh, by, by Sar a very short time. And then as a conclusion, Indeed, we need to work on all the levels of the cascade, on all the level of the, st the, 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 and the steps that need to be uh, taken into account from prevention to retention and adherence. But we need to do that on a smart way. We need to focus particularly on age groups. We need to focus particularly on the gender issues and we need to focus on where we for the moment still have not uh, reached out to population that are still escaping uh, the offer of treatment and uh, testing. And I would like to thank you very much for that opportunity. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, Mark, you can actually sit here because there may be questions for you afterwards. Thank you very much. And it's a shame that there was no sound uh, on the film because I wanted to quote a few words. People, they need to be reminded why they are on airways, which was the words of Selivet uh, Lamine and Louvo, who works as a lay councillor. And you saw her in the film, even though you didn't hear her. And she's going to tell you a bit more about her experience from being a lay councillor in Quesada and KwaZulu Natal. And also perhaps talking about the difference that, that the work you are doing actually makes for people in encouraging them to take their, their treatment. Welcome. Okay. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I greet you all. Uh, and I would also like to greet KZN. I know that they are listening and they are watching uh, the conference. Uh, my name is Teliwe Lamine Lovu, and I, I joined MSF uh, HIV project in Guazulu Natal in South Africa since 2011, October. Okay, um, here in the slides, it's one of the project catchment area where we work. Um, I wanted to highlight so that you can see that uh, the infrastructure is not that good in our project. Um, the households are scattered. And I mean, as you can see, there is no health facility structure that is appearing in this uh, picture. So it tells us that our patients need to walk a long distance to go to the facility. OK, my presentation, start with the slides. I'll revisit. OK, John. What happened to my <laughs> presentation? The actual presentation, okay, you only have, okay. It's okay, I'll, I can go back. Can you please pass my paper there? So I'll just link. Sorry about that. Okay, so our, as I was just saying that um, I'm, I've, I've joined a, our project in 2011. My main role is that I'm a, I was a counselor mentor at that time. I was providing counseling to patients with HIV and TB. And our project is supporting nine health facilities, which are which belong to Department of Health. And um, the facilities that we are supporting are in a rural context and urban as well. So um, I'm happy that I had the opportunity to work in that project because it's a great project. We are making a huge improvement to patients' life. So my role has been focusing on providing education and psychosocial support to all patients who are visiting our health facilities. And more so, I also provide trainings and mentorship to Department of Health lay counselors to ensure that um, standards and norms of uh, education and counseling are implemented in a good manner in all health facilities. Uh, my experience as a counsellor, I've seen and heard patients coming up with uh, different challenges that they face in their daily life when they are tested HIV positive. I will just share a few stories that I've heard and listened that, uh, that were said by the patient. One old lady said, I will not disclose my status to my husband because he might say I came with HIV. So this old lady tested positive and willing to start treatment, but she could not disclose to the husband because she has fear. And another one is saying, young, I mean, a young bride end up mix feeding her infant, knowing exactly that she's putting her infant in a risk of getting HIV. Her reason was that my mother-in-law is saying, breast milk is not enough for my child. If I do not allow, and she also said, if I do not allow my mother-in-law to give uh, my child something else, she will suspect that I'm sick. And another one, I mean, in our facilities, I've, as I've mentioned, that uh, we are supporting nine facilities, which are in different areas. So we find that many of our patients are on ART, but they do not know how to monitor the treatment success, and they do not know how to in, in, interpret their blood results. They will take blood, but they don't know what is it for. So. Those are the challenges that our patients are facing on daily. And then we have a huge number of children who are in care in our clinics, but they do not know what treatment are they taking is it for. 
there is one incident which was very touching for me. A 14-year-old girl came to the health facility with other school children to come to do just the HIV test. And then while we were doing counseling, the child told us that uh, she's on TB medication. She's been taking it for a very long, her granny said it's a TB medication. And her results tend to be HIV positive. So what does that tell us? The child is already on art, but not knowing. And the girl is 14 years old. And uh, another last, last uh, story, it's one patient who was not adhering well on her treatment. And then when we asked her and what was the main problem, she said, I keep my medication outside of my room because I'm afraid my husband will see my treatment. These people are married, staying together, but there is fear still of the husband finding out that the wife is on treatment. As I've mentioned these few points, um, it's clear that patients face many different challenges every day and lay counselors play important role to address through with different interventions. As we are lay counselors, we, we empower patients with um, relevant information about the illness and its treatment. We continue providing ongoing support to ensure improvement of adherence. So we've come up with different strategies to assist patients to be able to deal with uh, challenges in a better way. We do the following things. If a patient is tested positive, and then um, the CD4 is saying the patient is eligible to be initiated on treatment. Firstly, we provide literacy classes. So when we do literacy classes, we share the information, we empower the patient to understand what does HIV do in his or in her body, and what will treatment do to suppress the, the virus. And then we also notice, notice that even if we do those literacy classes, sometimes patients still have challenges. We started a program which is called adherence planning. W what we do, we do, we do that uh, on an initiation day when the patient is starting treatment. On the, on the very same day, we will sit with a, a, a patient. And then we want the patient to think, why is it important for them to start treatment? What is it that will make them to live? Why they still want to live? Why they don't want to, to die? So they think, often we'll find that some of patients, they don't even know why they are living. They're just living. So when we do adherence planning, we make them to think, what is it? Most of them, they, they say, OK, I want to see my children growing up. I want to see them finishing school. Or I'm still supporting my family. It depends. Although sometimes you will find patients who are really having a difficult life who will say, when you say, OK, what is important? What are your goals? They will say, I don't have any goals. All my family have died, I, I'm not working. So those are the challenges as we are the counselors that we faced as well. And we are trying to assist our patients to be able to adhere on treatment because the purpose of starting them on treatment is to make them to live and adhere to treatment. So we don't end there. We continue to provide adherence counseling after patients have been initiated on treatment. Why do we do that? Because we've done already adherence counseling. We know that even all human beings will make a plan but it does not mean that your plan will work. Sometimes patients will have good plans, but then when they get to their families, it does not work. So we do a follow-up when we do enhanced adherence counseling to ensure that did the plan make, or we need, to, I mean, did the plan work, or we need to help the client to make another plan. Should it happen that, okay, we saw the client during con uh, adherence counseling, and then time for taking bloods come, the results come back, the viral load results come back and suppressed. We don't just leave the patient with the high viral load. We will have a session which we call enhanced adherence session. So on when we do enhanced adherence, uh, enhanced adherence session, we focus on the actual results. What happened? Does the client or does the patient understand the implications of having a high viral load? Sometimes we'll find that the, the patient is happy when you say your viral load is 5,000, they just smile. Because it tells us as, as counselors that the patient did not understand what is viral load. The viral, I mean, what, what is a good viral load and what is not an unsuppressed viral load. So we'll help the patient and then redo the planning now. What will happen? How will the patient make this viral load to be, supp to be suppressed? And as I've indicated in my point where I was talking about the 14-year-old the who did not know her status. 
as a project, we, we came up with the strategy of assisting the guardians or the parents in terms of disclosing. How do they go about on disclosing to their children? Because it was clear that guardians or parents, they have fear of telling their children that they are HIV positive. So firstly, we empowered the guardians and the parents with um, providing counseling sessions. And, and we also share the IEC material that is talking about the step, how do you go about in terms of disclosing? So after we've disclosed, after the after the that part, the mother or the guardian will go home and then disclose. It depends if they choose to come to the facility, so that the counselor will be there to support. That is allowed. So we've achieved so many. Many of our children who are in our facilities are disclosed. After that, we will start children. We start children support groups to ensure that those children who now know that they are HIV positive, they are retained to care and they are here. I think um, Mark was also mentioning about the adolescent because sometimes you'll find that um, when they reach the adolescent stage, they will drop out from the health care facilities. So with the support group, we are trying to create a good environment for them to see that they are not alone. There are also other children who are HIV positive. And um, also counselors are facilitating patient clubs, which USA will deal more about, uh, talk more about the clubs. So these things that I've mentioned are done by the lay counselors. But now the situation is a bit different because um, Today, in our health, I mean, when I started as a counselor mentor, in our health facilities, we had 30 lay counselors that I was providing mentorship to them. But now we only have eight which are remaining in health facilities. This is due to the fact that the authorities decided to, stop, to stop the the lay counselor position. And they are expecting that the overburdened nurses are, are the ones who are going to provide counseling and patient education. How are they going to do that? So now, due to this change, the role of the MSF counselor mentors has changed because they are no longer mentoring as there are, there are no counselors. So, and also the nurses are unable to provide uh, counseling and education to the patient. With, with this thing, with this, um, with this, I'm very worried that the phasing out of the counselors affects the care of our patient. Counseling and education standards and norms are now hardly respected, uh, as the nurses are the ones who are doing HIV testing. And they all, we, we know that the nurses have a lot of tasks that they are also doing and providing to the patient. So they don't have time to do health education to our patient and to do counseling for our patient and to follow up. So I've, we, I've already noticed the decrease in number of HIV testing in health facilities. And Mark showed the slide that was showing that. And also the increased number of patients who are having adherence problem. So I think uh, I mentioned this. OK, this is one of the pictures whereby I was doing health education. We do health education in groups or in uh, individual cases, whereby we educate patients with uh, different topics. It's either it's TB or it's HIV. And here, when we do counseling, we are using flip charts, which are visual aids, so that we can, uh, the patient can clearly see what we are talking about. And uh, early this year, we hold a adherence summit for patients who are on ads because we were noticing that patients now are presenting with high viral load. So we wanted to find out from them what is it. So with this summit, we really find out what was bothering the patient and we are trying to improve, in, uh, I mean, as we are the counselors. And then, um, as I mentioned that, we, we started support children support groups. So with the children support groups, uh, they meet once a month or once in two months to discuss and th get their medication. Here we were having a life skills workshop for them because it was clear when we hold those uh, support groups on a monthly basis that there are burning issues that we are not able to tackle. In this, in this group, uh, it's more of the ones that are adolescent. They have issues on how do they go about disclosing to their partners because they've started dating. So here there was one, uh, one of my supervisors, but she left now. Jessie was, she's a psychologist. So she was supporting us because there, will be sto there were stories here which were discussed, which were advance who needed uh, someone at a higher level in terms of counseling because as we are lay counselors we are more trained on hiv and aids and tp 
So I'm almost finished. Irrespective of all the challenges, I'm still passionate about my job as I believe that we improve lives by being there. We provide emotional support to all patients who are HIV infected and affected. Um, However, there is an urgent need for policymakers, donors, and Department of Health to address the lack of recognition and financial support for cadres such as counselors who are always listening, who are always willing to listen and assist patients to resolve any challenges to improve their lives. Thank you. Because, uh, you can sit by the table here. Okay. Uh, I think there is a name. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, in the middle, please. Uh, I actually have two questions for you, Lindy, uh, uh, Saliva, sorry. Okay. And uh, how many patients are you attending to, basically, in your group that you are supporting as a counsellor? Okay, uh, depending on a day, mm. on how many patients are coming to the facility, because they come, like, patients are given their appointment dates to come and collect medication. As we, I was highlighting the things that we, we, we do as counsellors, so you might find that there are patients who are already stable, they just come to collect medication who does not need counselling sessions. But you still see, but in, in busy clinics, maybe you'll find that a day, the one lay counsellor will see maybe 15 or more patients. Yes. That you are supporting with advice and trying to... Yes. Yeah. And I also wondered, because you told us about the mother with the infant and that she was breastfeeding due to the stigma that she was afraid that someone would understand her not breastfeeding would mean that she actually is HIV positive. What advice would you give her? What we've done, um, we, 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 we started, we provide them with counselling so that they will understand why is it so important for them to stick to the breastfeeding for a certain time that is I mean, said by the nurses or by the doctors. And we, we empower them to know that if they mix feed, that is putting the, their children or their infant at risk. And we, we've started, as much as I did not highlight that, we've started to engage with the communities so that the stigma will go down and to make the mother-in-laws to understand that it's not always the case whereby they need their, their, I mean, their brides need to mix feed. And so that if we believe that if the community understand that, uh, Mixed feeding is putting risk to the infant. So we are educating the community more now about HIV because the issue is that they don't understand like what, what is happening with HIV, yes. So we just believe that by empowering the community, those, the stigma will go down as much as we cannot be sure that it will be finished, but we are reaching out by providing education. Thank you very much. And you are working in KwaZulu Natal yes. with, with the MSF project. And I know that you also in an MSF been looking at the region and and uh, of Southern Africa, South Africa, Lesotho, Swaziland, Mozambique, Namibia, Malawi, uh, and uh, and Guinea as well. And uh, Sar Bart from MSF uh, is going to tell us more about the regional study and what you've found out. Welcome. Thank you. Yes? Okay, good. Um, so indeed, I think we already had a great picture of what's happening in the shower drawn by, by Mark and, and Siliwe. And the goal would be is that I now zoom out a bit more on what's happening on lay councillors in the region within South and Africa. Uh, and that's where the title comes from, HIV TB counselling, who is actually doing the job uh, in uh, South and Africa. So this image, uh, you have already seen it by Mark, and we really like to use it. Uh, which is actually showing in numbers what the 1990-90 goals actually should mean. Uh, and on the top you can see what the goals are and at the bottom you can see what the reality is. So there's clearly big gaps uh, in what we want to uh, get at and where the situation is today. And so that's why different strategies have been put in place in our, uh, in our projects, like task shifting, decentralization, integration of HIV services. And there's one specific strategy which I want to talk about, uh, which is patient education and counselling. Uh, as Siliwe already talked us through, patient education and counselling plays actually an important role at different drops in this uh, HIV cascade. Uh, she talked about HIV testing and, and counselling. 
I don't see the thing. Uh, HIV testing and counselling, which actually tries to address this big, uh, the first big gap uh, or drop in the cascade. Um, secondly, there's art initiation counselling. So when people are supposed to uh, start treatment, that's where Siliwe and her colleagues play an important role to explain patients. Uh, what is it about and how can you adhere and to ensure that these patients actually reach a, a suppressed viral load. Then, uh, to ensure that people retain in care, we have set up different patient-centered ref art refill models, of which I'm going to talk more about this afternoon. And again, that's where education and counselling plays a role to ensure that patients are aware of these models, that they know what is asked from them uh, uh, in these models and so on. So the counsellors play a, an important role in facilitating these models. And then at the end you see enhanced adherence counselling, which is the, what we call patients who are red flagged, patients who haven't been able to reach an undetectable viral load. We do interventions with them to see, okay, what's going on now here, how can we help uh, you? So that's where counselling and education plays an important role and also, as you see on the left, uh, also counselling and education for these high-risk groups. Uh, as Saliwe was talking about, these pregnant mothers who are HIV positive or these uh, young adolescents who are HIV positive but are actually not even aware that they're HIV positive. So that's where it's also a key intervention for, uh, for our counsellors' teams. Uh, now, of course, in, in South Africa, we, we have uh, the big question is who will actually do this? Uh, if you look here uh, on this graph, this actually shows the number of healthcare workers available uh, according to patients. On the right, uh, uh, the most right hand column you see on the uh, down there, uh, this is what WHO actually recommends to have at least 230 health workers for 100,000 patients. And this is what the reality is. Malawi, only 36 uh, healthcare workers. Uh, take Mozambique, 44. Uh, uh, it's going better as we, as we go down the line. But mainly the issue is, okay, if there's already that few healthcare workers, who will then take up these supportive tasks for our patients? And so that's where this whole idea came of, of lay counsellors. Um, so to give it a bit of a definition, who are we talking about? These are actually cadres who perform these patient education and counselling tasks, mainly at the health facility. And we have been training these people to do these tasks, but they don't have any tertiary or, or higher education to do this. Huh? So mostly we talk about people who have been through secondary, uh, secondary school, uh, who come from the same community, community who may be HIV positive themselves and who have been trained on this uh, supportive tasks. Hmm? So we decided to invest in them because actually uh, they, they need a less of an extended training if you compare that with a nurse. Uh, they're actually, uh, it, it, also, it comes at a lower cost to, to implement them and we can also retain them easier uh, because they, uh, they come from the same community and understand the issues that our patients face. Um, but what did we see uh, in, uh, in our settings, not only in KwaZulu-Natal, who uh, had recently decided to withdraw the counsellors, but we actually see that we're caught up in a vicious circle of lack of recognition and lack of financial support for these cadres. So on the one hand, we see, okay, there's a lack of national policy. Ministries of Health tell us, okay, we don't, we don't have enough resources to actually work out a proper policy for these lay cadres. Uh, this results on the ground in a lack of supervision uh, of these cadres, because it's not really clear who's going to do it, and a lack of sustained financial support. Uh, so partners may come in and they, they, they're going to fund that cater for, for a number of time, and then it stops, and then the question is, okay, who's going to take this over again. And all of this is, yeah, there's a lack of recognition of them. Again, donors say, okay, we're willing to support this temporarily, but you need to show us a plan of how you're going to sustain them. So you need to have a, a plan of recognition and so on. And so it gets caught up in, in this whole circle again, because the Ministry of Health doesn't have a plan, because they say we don't have resources. So it's, uh, we're making circles there. Um, so actually to look a bit more in depth at the situation, that's where we, uh, that's uh, everything is, is here in this report. Uh, we did a number of country studies to review and compare uh, uh, what the situation of these lay cadres is. Uh? Uh, so we did a lot of discussions with, uh, uh, with country-based staff of, of ministries of health, donors, NGOs. Uh, we, uh, we looked at policy documents and so on mainly uh, in countries in South Africa, uh, Lesotho, Malawi, Mozambique, 
Swaziland, South Africa and Zambia, uh, and Zimbabwe. And then we also looked at Guinea because we're there as well as MSF, so we had easy access. Uh, but they're not South and Africa, if uh, <laughs> you would be hesitating on that. Um, so what did we do? We looked at some general indicators of what is their general country profile. We looked at harmonization of these cadres within the country. We looked at the national strategies that may or may not exist. And we looked at how these cadres were or were not financed in these settings. Now, what did we find? Um, regarding harmonization, uh, basically you have to imagine, I just, I just came back from Malawi, and we have a bunch of lay cadres there floating around. Some are called mental mothers, others are called peer educators, others are called psychosocial counselors, uh, others are treatment literacy agents whatsoever. It all depends a bit on which, which partner is, uh, is intervening and how they like to call it which is a bit of a worrying situation. Luckily, the situation is not like that in, in every country. So we do clearly see some progress in trying to standardize all those different cadres uh, that exist and try to standardize job profiles and, and training. Yeah? And that's where ministries of health actually play a very important role to take on these, this, this leading uh, role in doing so. Um, in general, however, we do see that the biggest focus that is given uh, or the biggest attention that is given of these locators is towards testing and counselling. So this first gap in the cascade. Yeah? However, this stands in clear cont uh, contrast to this lack of uh, attention on adherence and on retention in care, which is also needed. It's not just about getting them starting in care, but it's also about keeping them in care. And the challenges which Siliwe actually talked about were a lot around, around this adherence and retention in care, uh, for which lay counsellors aren't often recognised their, their full role yet. Um, in the different countries we saw, there's, there's this tension between should we go for a more generalised cadre, like Malawi, for example, has a community health worker cadre which exists, and which they said, okay, this task of HIV testing and counselling, we're going to include that in their job profile. So that, that was on the one hand easy because it was an existing cadre, uh, but this cadre is being... Well, we call it task shifting, but you could call it task dumping from time to time, is getting loads of tasks on their shoulder. Everybody gives their tasks to them. And in the end, uh, honestly, those poor guys, I don't know how they do it and how they uh, are able to combine uh, all of what is asked to them. And so some settings rather said, OK, we're going we're gonna to go for a specialized cadre. So Zimbabwe, Zambia, for example, has a specialized lay counselor cadre who, uh, who has a clear uh, restricted standard set of tasks. Um, another tension which we saw is this, this tension between should they be community or facility based. In most of the settings these people work facility based, but now there's also a clearer recognition that we need to go for like community testing strategies as Mar uh, Mark also showed. So we'll also need to think of how, how to create that balance between facility and community based uh, um, amount of time, where, where do they spend it and how we're going to frame that. So harmonization, there is still something to do, but we've already came a big way in, in, in moving forward uh, and, and harmonizing this further. Um, now, what we can we find back in national strategies? Uh, actually, uh, national guidelines on how to support adherence and retention in care are only emerging now in the last year in a few countries. South Africa is busy uh, launching their, their adherence and retention uh, guideline now. Uh, Zimbabwe also did that uh, this year. Uh, and these, these national policies are somewhere also needed to show the, the importance of, of such patient education and counselling interventions. Eh? National task shifting frameworks, so how, which tasks can we give to a, a lower trained cadre, uh, are mostly lacking uh, in, a lot of, uh, in a lot of settings. So there's no clear vision on what do we want to task shift to these, these lay cadres, what is feasible, what is not. Hmm? Uh, and we see that a lot of countries are actually pushed to go from short to long term strategies, but we clearly see that there's a need for some interim solutions because uh, it is quite hard to ask a country within three years, ensure that this new cater suddenly now gets, uh, gets recognized in your Ministry of Health payroll. Um, in terms of financing, there's different contracting and financing options that exist, uh, not only within the, the Ministry of Health staff establishment, but also outside of it. 
but countries face multiple constraints. Eh? There's wage bill policies, which actually put a maximum on the amount of people that they can enroll uh, on, the, on the Ministry of Health staffing. Often they struggle with pre-education criteria, uh, and these pre-education criteria are often a lot higher uh, than, than the ones we require for lay workers. There's issues of career progression or of career path, and the donor condition to actually fund certain staff is often uh, you need to absorb them, and that's where the time frame is often not realistic. Um, so I see my time is limited, right? So I'm not going to go through all of this, but I think it's just important to show that there's there's different contract types which countries have uh, have. Um, experience with and it's uh, uh, which can be really creating a new cater and integrating that in the MOH staff establishment uh, but it can go as far as having like in South Africa in, in uh, Western Cape, for example, the Ministry of Health uh, actually subcontracted an NGO to uh, uh, train this cater to hire this cater and, and could avoid a lot of uh, stumbling blocks into having to integrate it. Eh? Um, so there's a lot of options existing and they're described in this report. Um, up, uh, sorry, let's go through this. Voilà. But in conclusion, I want to say lay councillors do play an important role in addressing the gaps in this cascade, whilst their position is often at stake. Eh? Definitely, how should we integrate them? There's no one size that fits it all. Countries have different uh, strategies to finance and to support lay councillors. But it's definitely clear that while they are trying to figure out which is the best way to do so, to integrate them, there is really a clear need to continue their donor support, uh, to continue the donor support to human resources for health, uh, to ensure that we have a sustained financial support of these cadres and to avoid situations like now in KwaZulu-Natal, where suddenly the lay councillors are phased out and people like Siliwe who are supposed to mentor people are actually seeing patients just because there's a lack of uh, lack of resources there. Thank you. Thank you, Sar. <laughs> Please have yeah. a seat at the table and I'm sorry for stressing you but I know also that we will have uh, that we have people sitting here that have questions for you. Before we start with questions I just want to tell you someone asked me whether the presentations from you and the other speakers will be available online and there they will be available uh, through MSF's web page, as I understand it. And please prepare your questions for this panel. Do we have, we have microphones? Do we have any questions? Everyone's too hungry? <laughs> no? Yes? Oh, it's not a question actually, just a few points that I would like to, to stress out. Um, um, Mark spoke about the issue of condoms in schools uh, <coughs> as, a, as a tool of preventative in, in South Africa. As treatment action campaign, we are, we, are, we are engaging the government on that policy to be pushed, to be out and condoms should be provided at school because we, are see, we see a lot of young uh, women being infected by HIV and <coughs> we still have problems there, especially in Gauteng, where the MEC of Health is not willing to give out condoms in schools. So there is a big debate around that. But uh, we, 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 we are saying yes to condom in school. Maybe that will uh, uh, at least uh, decrease the number of young women who are getting infected by HIV. Because there are a lot of factors that are making these women to be uh, to be uh, infected by HIV, and then to the issue of uh, disclosure that the uh, talked about, uh, especially to young people, uh, that's 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 a big uh, uh, th that's a big issue in South Africa. A lot of young uh, young young adolescent. Uh, uh, they don't know their status and they don't know how to, the parents, they don't know how to disclose to their children. And we are seeing a lot of cases where they, 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 they are not uh, adhering to, 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 to their treatment. For instance, uh, in a few weeks ago, I was visiting one of the hospitals of which I see three young girls lying in the pa in, uh, in, in hospital without, they, they, they are not adhering to, uh, to their treatment. And... <coughs> 
they are not accepting their status because they don't they are still angry about why they are why they are hiv positive and there's no psychological support that is given to them so i think we need to we need to focus more on young people than <coughs> uh, like than what we are doing now and the issue of mental illness uh, especially to people who are living with hiv a lot of them in in Gauteng, we are seeing 30% we are having 30% uh, people who are not uh, adhering to their treatment, of which that means there is a psychological support that it's needed for those people. So, yeah, those are, are my points for now. Does any of you want to comment on that? In the panel? No? <laughs> okay. Perula <laughs> yeah. Pasha. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for excellent presentations. Uh, I would just ask you, who are working in the field, uh, how much are you helped by these uh, UNAIDS uh, goals, 1990, 90, uh, for example, which to me, 1990, 90 by 2020, which is uh, nice figures in a way, but uh, how realistic are they and how, how, how are you helped by, by these figures? 1990, 90, we have reached it in Sweden where we have the best results in the world of, of treatment. Uh, but in United States, for example, they, have, they are far away from, from reach, having reached that uh, after a lot of years. And so is it, is, is it hampering you or is it helping you? Is it a good tool? Yeah. Yeah. No. Maybe I might uh, take it up. Um, indeed, uh, we are usually a bit scared of, of big targets that really show somewhere that we're nearly towards uh, reaching that that goal. On the other hand, I think uh, it's a powerful uh, catchment uh, sentence by which somewhere it summarizes very much what needs to be done. We need first to catch the people and test them, we need to put them on treatment, we have to keep them on treatment. It's the first time I think that we have a sentence like this that also can summarize um, the, the complexity of often chronic treatment. And I was in August in uh, KwaZulu-Natal and I met the district authorities there and I was very surprised that a few months after that UNAIDS had come out, they already knew about it and they were proud to say that thanks to MSF they had already realized this cascade logic. I think um, having these goals, these targets, help us to evaluate, and that's now what we've decided to do. We evaluate together with health healthcare workers where they are in every health center with their own cohort, with their own number of patients. How many of them should you have tested? Have you tested? How many of them are already on treatment and should you have on treatment? How many of them have an undetectable viral load? This is a very powerful uh, message and uh, exercise analysis that we do together with the healthcare workers to make them realising afterwards why we want to invest in counselling, why we want to get them out in the community for testing the people and so on. It's a powerful way of looking where we are and knowing where we are, making you aware about where the priorities are is a powerful planning tool. So yes, I would say it's helpful, but it's not uh, by saying that we should now uh, uh, rest in uh, look backward what we've done up to now. Saliva, what would you say? Would it help you when, or or other counsellors in uh, in getting support, getting funding? Uh, for now, I would say the 1990 goal is good, but the problem now is that since the counselors are phased out, who, who's going to be mm. testing these people? Mm. And who's going to be providing adherence counseling? Because as much as we want to put more people on treatment, but if we are failing to retain them, it will be pointless. And uh, I think maybe our government needs to look at that point and see what can be improved. Yes. Uh, yes, please. Mm -hmm. uh, is <laughs> Hi, I'm Anna Rambe. Uh, thank you for very interesting presentations. I work with ORIFSU, which is the Swedish Association for Sexuality Education, and I've also worked for a number of years with the, the Noah's Ark. Um, I was wondering about uh, the gender ratio among the lay councillors. It was uh, touched upon several times already in this morning, the importance of, of uh, involving men uh, in the fight against HIV. So I was wondering whether there is a strategy to include men uh, in 
the recruitment to lay councillors as part of involving men and, and being able to address uh, men uh, by men uh, in this uh, when when you do your work as lay councillors. And also, I was wondering whether there is any specific LGBT training or component in the lay councillor training to address some of the specific uh, issues that might be relevant for this, as we also heard in the morning, very vulnerable uh, key population. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sa, do you want to take <coughs> Yeah. Um, good question. Uh, I don't think we have a, a clearly thought through strategy to ensure that there's a good gender balance between our, uh, within our lay councillors group. I don't know how it is in a show, but definitely in, uh, in other projects, we do have quite a lot of uh, quite a number of, of men uh, who are lay councillors, but I think it could be interesting for us to, to look into uh, look into this a bit to see if that uh, that is well addressed. Um, in certain projects, or uh, yeah, according to certain strategies, we do recruit specifically men. For example, like in in Kailicha, South Africa, uh, there is uh, we have a male clinic, and there they really try to attract male councillors uh, to ensure that they can uh, they can. Um, talk to the issues of, of men. Uh, but in general, for the general population, we haven't addressed it as such as a, as a clear strategy. Um, when it comes to key populations, as you say, um, uh, uh, working with MSM, and, and I would even expand it working with sex workers, I think we clearly see that for our own staff, uh, there is an issue of, of ensuring that we address uh, attitudes and, and values regarding to this key population uh, for them as well. Uh, it's not because they're a lane counsellor that they're all open to that and feel at ease to work uh, with these groups. Um, and I think what we also try to do uh, to reach this group and, and to ensure that we, we get into their social structure is that we have um, we have others, what we call them, more peer counsellors, like commercial sex workers, uh, who actually do the social uh, social mobilisation, who ensure that uh, their peers are aware that we're that we're coming over for HIV testing, or uh, that they can address us for for this and this uh, cases. But definitely, there's there's a clear idea needed on ensuring that we work on attitudes and norms of our own staff, not only lay counsellors but also our medical staff. Uh, I'd say. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I. I think, do we have one more question or let's make that the last question because after that we'll go for lunch and there will be more opportunities to ask questions in the afternoon as well. Okay, hello. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering because I know that in Africa people are... Sorry, uh, would you mind just telling us who you are? Ah. <laughs> it's, it's good. <laughs> I am Hadi, but I, I, come, I was studying a uh, master in palliative care at Sofia Hemet. And I come from Senegal originally. I was just wondering uh, if you are working with church or because we know that in Africa people are very religion oriented, and we have a lot of issue related to using uh, condoms. And I know that uh, HIV is still uh, uh, associated to mm. sex uh, and. That's a big taboo, and I want to know if you are working closely with those uh, uh, communities, religious communities. Are you working yeah. together with the church, or is the church working against you? Okay, on that point, um, <laughs> our project, we started to engage with churches, with uh, chiefs in the community, and to the point we are also participating if there are the male uh, meeting, males in meetings, in the community whereby we will one of our community health agent will go and visit and be part of the meeting and afterwards the males will be offered HIV and counseling and testing by another male who was the part of that meeting but we are engaging with all the I mean the churches all the the stakeholders that play a huge role in the community we engage with them and we also do trainings for them or in workshops that is capacitating them about HIV Mm. Yeah, but but sure. we do face problems indeed. I remember Lesotho where, well, we were not able in a very prone, Catholic prone uh, district 
to condomize or to promote even family planning. So we are struggling and indeed we need them to think out of the box again. And in fact, what we just do is to put our services just outside of the health center that is run by the Catholic services. They do an excellent job, but they are quite stubborn on that aspect. And it went to even writing to the Pope and we got an answer back from the Vatican saying that they would consider our concerns. <laughs> <laughs> but I think Sounds now like we need to fight progress. on that. <laughs> Thank you very much. And now there is lunch outside. There are wraps and there are vegetarian alternatives. And I just want to take up on what Ophelia said before the break, that who do are coming to these seminars? Who are we talking to when we, we talk upon integrating different actors in working against HIV AIDS? So please talk to someone you don't know from before during lunch break and talk about these issues or something else that's been raised. And I'll see you here at one o'clock again.
Uh, they told me that MSF today is not only a life-saving organization in emergency situations around the world, but also an organization that is trying to work innovative with finding new ways of, and, uh, of improving healthcare all around the world. And that is, of course, why we have this seminar today. Uh, and we are now going to talk about innovative approaches in HIV care through community-based care. So I want to welcome Dr. Anna-Mia Ekström, who is a professor in public health, HIV, at Karolinska. And she will talk about sustainability and effectiveness challenges in future large-scale HIV treatment in resource-poor settings. And I mean, if you want, I think it's maybe easier to stand here and then you can control the slides also. Welcome. So thank you. Yeah. To be here. Uh, I know many of you <laughs> already and um, I know uh, some of the things uh, that are in my presentation have uh, already been covered in the morning so I'll skip those you know very fast and try to focus on a few things that I don't think have been covered uh, so much so far. I work as an HIV clinician uh, one day a week at Huding Hospital and most of my research for the rest of the time is uh, in East Africa, South Africa. So I think you've talked about this and uh, I wanted just to emphasize more about not the achievements we know very much about, more on uh, what we have left to do. And I'll talk a bit more about that too, to uh, how we can try to get more people on treatment and also stay adherent to treatment and improve retention in mother-to-child transmission programs, in prevention of mother-to-child transmission programs. We have a lot to do still, about half don't know their status, and the majority of women still drop out from mother-to-child transmission programs. So I know you've also talked about uh, young girls, and here I wanted to share with you uh, some of the research that we've been doing in terms of young women's risk behaviors and sexual networks. And I have several PhD students in South Africa who've interviewed young women, for example, at uh, Chivines and sort of bars on why, why uh, no, still knowing you know, that HIV is, is quite prevalent in many of the townships, why they're still engaged in this, in this uh, high risk behavior. And, and a lot of obviously has to do with, with being young when you don't sort of, you live for the day much more and the thinking that you know okay i might die when i'm 35 plus doesn't really matter because life is sort of pretty much not so interesting anyway as, as an old person you live much more for the day and also the, the the sort of lack of other sources of income if you want some sort of cash on your pocket transactional sex i think you've mentioned that the possibility to get a little bit of cash to refill your cell phone or to buy a new skirt or something is something that they sort of mention as a very important factor. They're obviously not sex workers, but transactional sex is an important part when you don't really have any other way of source of income, when your parents can't give you any pocket money, for example, and you're still in school. So one of the citations was that um, money talks, bullshit walks, and bullshit is HIV then. It's really not so much of an issue, even though it's very much known. And when we interviewed young men with multiple sexual partners in, in Kailitsha, this network figure was created by one of my other um, previous PhD students, where men sort of really value their core sexual net, sexual groups, uh, the core groups of friends, I should say, and, and had uh, sexual networks that, which were organized from these core groups, which are the blue dots. And uh, many had sort of more stable long-term girlfriends, maybe that what they had children with, and whom they also gave uh, money regularly as sort of responsible fathers, but they also had other uh, networks outside of the relationship. And much of this was sort of facilitated also through mobile phone networks. Uh, of course, if, if someone in this network is newly infected, the infection will spread quite, quite rapidly in this network. And also, uh, the women uh, felt that they, when you interviewed women, then that many of them knew that their partners had other partners. And they sort of felt, well, I don't want to be, you know, I, I also 
I don't want to feel stupid and not have a backup if my partner sort of dumps me for somebody else. And also viewed this as being more and more liberated and modern women that you choose your sexual partners the way men always have done. You know, you don't sit around waiting to be picked up or, or selected, but you're also, you're also an active, uh, sort of liberated, free woman. Uh, but obviously more vulnerable than to HIV infection. So, uh, talking then about the uh, risk of scale, the, the different difficulties in scaling up uh, access to treatment. Obviously, we still struggle with lots of uh, health system shortcomings, both in terms of stock out of HIV tests, but also in terms of, of the medication. Uh, so, lots need still to be done in, to ensure regular access if we want adherence to be improved. And we need to make access much more easy out at the community level. And uh, right now, for example, you need to refill every month. And that requires for some people a month, a, a full day of, of, of going to the clinic, lining up, queuing. And once you actually get there, it's 40 degrees you know, Celsius. You have your children screaming next to you, uh, or you have to take a full day off from work. You need to pay for transport. Once you get there, there's no medication. If you've done that three months in a row, you sort of get sick of it. <laughs> Really, and also that you need to line up in front of an HIV specific clinic is a problem because you may be seen then if you have to stand there for hours by your neighbors, etc. So the lack of integration of HIV care into primary care and the fact that you need to refill this medicine so often and, and go long distances to do so is a big problem in terms of long term adherence. So integration is very important and also facilitating that so that they can perhaps get medications for longer. In Sweden, we prescribe from three to six months, for example. But that, of course, requires a functioning um, drug distribution system where there are not regular stockouts. Now, right now, you might have so few drugs in stock, so you can't end up more than a month at a time. So we really need this, the drug, drug distribution system to work for, for the millions of people who need care. It's not just the, the staff, it's also really to look at these drug delivery systems. Uh, we've talked about adherence and that uh, so far less focus has been on long-term adherence. Much of the focus has really been on getting more people onto treatment. That's also what UNAIDS and many uh, other organizations report is the success in recruiting sort of new heads, new counts, while, while people who are retained in care, is much less, there's much less focus on that. And usually you only measure the people who are still at the hospital, what their viral load is, etc. But all of those who've dropped out are sort of lost. Uh, a month ago or so I was in, in Kenya uh, and one of the most successful clinics in, in Western Kenya had uh, initiated 17,000 people on treatment in the last few years. But 5,000 of those had now dropped out and nobody knew where they were. Many were children, obviously. So and when they reported adherence, they only reported among the adherence among those who remained in treatment but a third had then dropped out and I might have sought care elsewhere or obviously weren't, probably weren't virally suppressed. And so we, we have to, and there's no, there was no system really of linking uh, mother-child pairs when moving from PMTCT programs into lifelong ART to make sure children and mothers weren't lost on the way. It was just, you know, two buildings next to each other, but it's the typical thing again of integrating, integrating different sorts of HIV care and different sorts of care, it doesn't work. There's no, there was no electronic system, no, not even, you know, a paper record system linking the child to the mother or making sure someone picked up if the child didn't, or the mother didn't show up at the sort of regular ART clinic, nobody would knew and no, nobody would track them because the PMTCT counselors were sort of really focused on their, their task and the ART counselors were focused on their task. There was no one making sure this transfer worked and that's a huge problem. Really, and also the fact that, as you see, we say, we see that support people, lay counts, uh, counselors, or even outreach workers are being uh, funding is being cut for them. Those are the ones that are really, really needed in terms of ensuring adherence. Because when you feel well and when you know your mother, the baby is safe, this is what mothers tell us, you sort of lose motivation a little bit to take the meds yourself as a woman because there's so much in your everyday life that you have to deal with. You need to make sure there's food on the table. You may not have food. You feel more dizzy when you take the drugs, etc., etc. So your, your focus, once you know your baby is safe, your focus and your motivation to take the medicine yourself declines. So we have, have a big problem of that in terms of PMTCT retention. And it relates to adherence. And this is a picture of, that I'm sure most of you know this, but 
the resistant viruses, the blue, you know, the blue spots, and the, the white spots is the drug susceptible virus, which is also called the wild type. So when you are on treatment, uh, which, when you have episodes of, of insufficient drug exposure due to stockouts, for example, or due to poor adherence for some reason, uh, the resistant virus will accumulate in your body. And once you are put on ART again, it doesn't work as well. And this is a problem because we usually have access to first or second line treatment in many low uh, poor resource settings. But third line treatment is sort of the expensive different alternatives that we can offer in Sweden today aren't available and are way too expensive um, to offer. So this is from uh, Nairobi, uh, from the uh, Kibera uh, urban slum there. And it's uh, just an example where we've done much research with, with AMREF. And uh, one example, it's sort of easy to understand why you can't really take your drugs when you live in a when you live in a in a shack like this, where if you haven't told your partners, for example, or your neighbors that you're positive, there's no way where to hide the med the actual drugs, and nobody wants to play with your children if they know they're positive or that you ha they have a positive mother. So disclosure is a huge issue, and also having I'm just thinking about when you have a community health worker there, if it's someone of your neighbors, the gossip going around is a big is a big risk really. So in terms of and I think it's not something that's talked so much about. Uh, disclosure and confidentiality issues with community health workers who may have two weeks of, of training or a few months of training at the best. Uh, confidentiality may not be their fir the first priority really. So many patients didn't feel comfortable knowing that their neighbor was a community health worker that would come to their house every day. Everybody knows everybody. They know if this person drops by every month or you know every week, then you, everyone knows you're positive. And then you may be an outcast. Stigma is still that high. And nobody wants to, you know, be with you or your kids. So, so many women, women and men choose not not to be stay adherent because of the risk of being unwanted disclosure in the neighborhood, which is a problem that we we really need to deal with. It's difficult. Mm. So this is also why retention in care. Uh, once you know your your child is safe. Uh, retention is the, the dropout from PMTCD is, is quite is quite high you struggle when you know that you have to but then when you can relax when you know the baby is negative or the uh, you sort of uh, your motivation to stay on treatment is is much lower so we see that actually a minority bring their children back for testing at two months already the the dropout from this PMTCT schedule is quite high and it goes on like that and very, very few continue the full breastfeeding period and bring their children back to, for, for final testing at, at 18 or 24 months when the final visit is supposed to happen. And this is some uh, result of that. This is a picture from uh, the Rakai orphan, AIDS orphanage, where uh, in a small fishing village we had uh, several hundred uh, children being AIDS orphans and the PMTCT clinic was uh, empty. There were no staff working anymore after the handover from from the research institution to the Ministry of Health. Uh, the uh, the the prevalence among uh, the bar girls, who was the, sort of the main occupation in, uh, among women in this extremely high risk fishing village, was really uh, many uh, worked to sell sex, and the HIV prevalence was around forty percent. So here, PMTCT should have worked extremely well because everyone was like two minutes walking distance from the clinic. ARVs were free of charge. People were informed about HIV. Still didn't work. So this is a big challenge. It's just that not the medicines. It really needs to be, information needs to be repeated. They need, they need to find really an incentive to do this and to retain. We need, and for that, I think we need lots of, of counselors and, and support supported people. I think you've touched up on this a, lit, a bit, so I'll skip this. Going then to community-based based approaches. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was in, in, in Cape Town and visited the Desmond Tutu uh, Foundation's team track, which I thought was an excellent example of uh, outreach 
Uh, it's an example of outreach where you have this truck which looks sort of attractive. Uh, it stops in, uh, at the townships and uh, and it offers, you know, you can braid your hair, you can check your email, you can get a health checkup, you can check your blood pressure, if, you're di if you have diabetes, listen to music, meet your friends, but they can also have an HIV test and get counseling. So I thought that's sort of an innovative a interesting approach to how you can reach young people and make it more attractive. This is now a South African setting, but I think similar things could be done also in other in, in East African settings too. We also know that self-testing is being tried uh, with very good results. Also in Cape Town, they have uh, also Desmond Tutu Foundation has initiated. You can get a motorcycle delivery, order your HIV test on the web, and a motorcycle a guy comes and delivers at your door, and then you get tested. And then there's a follow up. There's sort of a signal to to the foundation that we've sold this test, and you hope that this person then will contact them. And there's a follow up uh, of the positive ones afterwards. So there's been a lot of worry. I think at least in Sweden, we think that people will go and commit suicide immediately if they test at home. So there's no way we would want to try this here. But if it works in other countries, it might actually work here. The number of people are more more aware. It might work. It's still a, a way to reach those that we don't reach with our, you know, normal outreach. So it's a way of reaching the the periphery, those that we still haven't reached, and which is about, you know, 17 out of the 37 million people living with HIV. We must find new ways of reaching them. And we know that door-to-door -door testing it really increases more. It reaches first-time testers, people who haven't tested it before, and people with higher CD4 accounts where we can go in and use treatment as prevention more effectively. And it leads to a greater uptake of, uptake of testing and linkage to care. How much time do I have? Nothing. Uh, well, you're already one minute past your okay. time. So you need to, to I need do to your sum summary. Up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so this is just showing that with the household testing only, it's the light uh, green uh, things and the status quo is the sort of the darker. So we really see that the additional things, both in terms of ART initiation threshold, higher CD4 counts, the number of people taking up uh, testing and the people who are stay adherent to ART increases with, with household counseling and testing. This is a study from, from South Africa. So I think I will just go to this thing then, the last thing. We really need to, to, to do something more about the stigma because now we know that the medicine works. The medical problem to a large extent, the medicines are fantastic, mir miracle drugs. There's as close to cure as, cure as we can come. We know that people can live a long life without affecting your partner, your child, and uh, there are very little side effects. The medical bit is almost sold, I would say. What we have to deal with now is stigma and the solution in terms of health systems to, to sustain this uh, long term. And this is just to um, uh, let you know that the study has been performed in Sweden, the biggest so far on quality of life, and it's going to be released tomorrow afternoon at HIV Sweden. And it shows that the uh, Swedish people, uh, people living in Sweden, where always uh, more than half have been born abroad, but they live in Sweden, are now uh, average seven out of ten on a quality of life scale. So quality of life is extremely good, except in terms of sex life, where one in four has stopped having sex after being diagnosed with HIV, and this is all due to stigma. It's nothing to do with you know medical problems or anything like that. It's all due to the fact that they know more than their potential partners. The society doesn't know how good the HIV medication is and that you can't transmit the virus to your partner when you're on, drug, on your ARVs. And if everybody knew that, stigma would be much, much, much lower. So I think that's our main task, to bring that message out. This fantastic treatment makes you uh, the, yeah, prevents you from infecting your partner and then life would be so much easier. Thank you. You, you can actually keep that one on and uh, have a seat at the table. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I remember that one of the stories I did in uh, when working in, s in Africa as a correspondent was actually a very interesting initiative in Botswana to end the stigma. There was a beauty contest called uh, Miss HIV, where HIV positive ladies were kind of competing in, in uh, a contest where it was very much about being outspoken and trying to break the stigma. So uh, it is an interesting 
it is a challenge, I think, still. And so far today, we've spoken about the challenges, about ways to meet them uh, with, for example, lay councillors. And we also talked about the small window of opportunity that we actually have today, where we can end the AIDS pandemic. But for that, money is needed, we've also heard. And Pia Engstrand is the lead policy specialist for health at SIDA, the Swedish International Development Agency. And I want to ask you the same question as I asked Mr. Jalmoker earlier. What about Sweden? Is the government prepared to put in more money? And are we willing to maintain the role we've maintained so far? The floor is yours. Thank you. <coughs> so we'll see how I... So let me start by thanking um, MFS, MSF very much for hosting and organizing this seminar. I think presentations have been excellent and uh, most of us, although many of us have been working on HIV and AIDS for, for a long time, I think we all have learned something new today. So thank you. Um, as uh, you mentioned, I work for a bilateral agency. We're a funding agency. We are not implementing programs. Uh, instead, we are funding uh, many of you who are here and others as well. Uh, so I'll start a little bit about... Um, no, I did something wrong. Is it the just... Aha. Uh -huh. Down. Okay. Okay. So, um, as I said, I've been working on HIV and AIDS for quite some time, um, and I I remember our old HIV and AIDS policy. I'm starting with this uh, just to be able to show you that Swedish and CEDA's priorities when it comes to HIV and AIDS have actually remained more or less the same. Uh, for a long time we have been focusing on prevention of HIV and also including what was at that time very sensitive, what the sexual and reproductive health and rights issues. You know that sexual rights issues at uh, international level, multilateral level and in countries is uh, oftentimes very sensitive and difficult to talk, to talk about. And this was really the case in the early 2000s and onwards. So uh, here you see what our uh, policy at that time included. And I want to move on from this looking at one of our key uh, strategies today where HIV is included. We uh, have a new strategy uh, for HIV, uh, for sexual and reproductive health and rights in Sub-Saharan Africa. It was adopted this summer. Uh, and it, it's a five-year strategy focusing on SRHR. This used to be a clear HIV and AIDS strategy when uh, but has now then become more of an SRHR strategy. I think this was mentioned previously. Are we now taking AIDS out of isolation? Are we talking about health broader, as Lennart mentioned, or are we talking still only HIV? And I think this is an example of how our current government wants to keep uh, priority on the broader issues, sexual and reproductive health and rights, and to see HIV as one of the priorities within that field. So this is uh, a strategy that has a large funding envelope. Uh, the Swedish government uh, puts in 350 million Swedish crowns to uh, work on SRHR and HIV at the regional level in Africa. Apart from that, we have HIV funding also coming from other uh, levels that we say uh, at SIDA, the global level. Uh, Lotta Roos, who is here, she's uh, handling a portfolio uh, including HIV AIDS Alliance, uh, IPPF and others at the global level. And then of course we have some funding for HIV at the country level and we say bilateral level. 
And in most of these uh, portfolios, uh, the focus is clearly on, on HIV prevention, on comprehensive sexuality education, on human rights for LGBT people. That is uh, fundamental to address HIV and AIDS, of course. Uh, but also, as you see, broader prevention of gender-based violence uh, and health system strengthening. Lennart mentioned that uh, we, Sweden, and then it's the Ministry for Foreign Affairs, um, puts in 850 million Swedish crowns to the Global Fund this year. I think all in all, the Ministry for Foreign Affairs and SIDA has uh, a total funding of 1.2 billion Swedish crowns for HIV and AIDS this year. And SIDA then has uh, about 400 million Swedish crowns of that. The team in Lusaka, our regional SRHR team, has a portfolio comprised of, of different partners. And, and one could, if one tries to, uh, say a little bit about what these partners do. Some of them work at service delivery, but not so much. You will see that the biggest chunk is really aiming at capacity building at uh, the national level, at community level, uh, and also regional level, meaning perhaps uh, or uh, African Union, SADC, and other key uh, or institutions and organizations. Another uh, important area in CEDA's funding is to advocacy. And that, uh, of course, aims to support partners who work towards the government on accountability uh, to improve legislation, etc., etc., which we think is, is very important. And then some to research and some to more normative work like UN organizations. This is uh, the partners at the regional level. And I wanted to show you this uh, so that you can see that uh, more than nearly half of the funding from our regional team, 350 million Swedish crowns, is allocated to civil society organizations. Civil society organizations are absolutely key and extremely important in order to, to uh, respond to the epidemic in, the, in Africa as in other regions. So there is about 50% that is allocated to civil society and other key partners are of course the multilaterals, the UN agencies and some research institutions. You won't see governments here because governments, they are funded from uh, country level. So in Zambia we work with the government, the Ministry of Health in Zambia, but that doesn't come from the regional account. And here you see the number of countries um, where our regional partners have partners in their turn, so uh, a clear focus is on Southern Africa where the epidemic is uh, the worst and Eastern Africa as well. But it, there are actually uh, activities carried out in, in most of the African countries. Okay, um, I took the uh, possibility to listen in to some of our partners, what they say about community care, uh, looking at what they do. And, and in that discussion, I also heard, heard clearly from them that we cannot talk only about HIV. HIV today in 2015 must uh, be put in the context of integration with other health issues, primary health care, and also talking about dialogue in the context, of course, of the SDGs. So community care must actually refer to community health um, and particularly in relation to sexual and reproductive health and rights. Another thing uh, to put on the table uh, is the uh, concepts of health system strengthening and community system strengthening. 
And those two cannot be seen as, as two different concepts. They are actually one and should be seen as one. It's, we should strengthen comprehensive and resilient systems for health in general. Um, because that way we include all aspects of the health systems, private, public, civil society, institutions, service providers, uh, systems for commodity supply, etc., etc. And then finally, the word care, which mean, used to mean palliative care, uh, house visits, etc. But as we have seen here in the presentations before, of course, we are talking about uh, health at community level, health care at the community level, which is much, much broader than that. And we're all, always including aspects uh, of prevention in that. We cannot talk only about uh, care in the old traditional way. Another key term is responsibility. And here I think uh, we have heard a, a lot about the important work that is done at the community level by lay councillors, etc. But it is the governments that are responsible for the health of their people. That's according to Alma Ata, and it's really the governments that are responsible. Communities are needed and they carry out most of the health services, they implement most of the services, but governments are to be held account. So that's uh, very key. Um, I think here I want to end just quickly, and we have heard this over and over again, it, looking forward, focus needs to be on adolescents. Adolescents living with HIV, their sexual and reproductive health uh, is, uh, is very difficult in many places. They don't know how to handle their sexuality uh, and parents have a problem. They don't know how to discuss sexuality uh, with their children uh, either. So that's uh, absolutely key. Another one uh, to tackle the ac epidemic is to really keep girls, keep girls in schools, in safe schools, uh, and, and then uh, focus also on sexuality education for everyone. Gender-based violence is a mean to uh, prevent HIV. Another one is to prevent early marriages, of course. Testing, we have discussed that, need to be simplified. Self-testing is, is an excellent way. And overall, gender equality. Work with men and with boys also, because they are uh, as uh, equally important as girls and women, of course, and they are uh, gatekeepers when it comes to reaching the women. Um, so with that, I stop. Thank you. Thank you. I was just curious, since we have a treatment action campaign here, are they, are you at all funding a treatment action campaign from CEDA? No. Okay. No. Yeah. We don't have bilateral development cooperation with South Africa any longer. So it's due to South Africa being a middle income country? Yes, one, yeah. one of those yeah. countries. Okay. Thanks for the explanation. And with that, I want to welcome uh, Sarah Bart, which you already met in the morning. And now you will talk to us about uh, patient and community. You are a TB patient and community support advisor, sorry. And you will talk about reaching closer to home, the MSF's experience with community based ART refill models. Welcome yes. again. Yes, thank you for uh, giving me the word. I think it works, yes. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope you won't regret giving me a second chance. <laughs> um, so, indeed, now I want to talk about something different, which is our community based art refill model. Well, introduced uh, this by Ophelia, this This one. Use yeah, that one probably. instead. This work, yeah. Okay. Um, 
So this is a bit of a similar story as, as Ophelia was telling us this morning. This is Mamo Tsilete from uh, Lusutu. Uh, she's actually asked to go to the health facility uh, once a month. She takes three hours to get to that health facility. And then she spends a full day waiting with other stable patients on art just to get her treatment from a completely overburdened nurse who doesn't know how to deal with the big patient load that is waiting there. Uh, to be seen by her. Uh, and actually, that's, that's uh, stories like this uh, actually made us as MSF to consider how are we going to go to deal with a growing cohort of uh, stable patients on art. And so that's why uh, in different contexts we actually asked ourselves the question of how could we differentiate care for stable patients on art. So this framework was developed after we did that actually, but it nicely resumes what I want to say. So basically we looked for stable patients on art. What service intensity do they need? Do they really need to be seen by a clinician every month? Uh, or is it just for, for art refills that they're, uh, that they're coming? Huh? We also looked at service frequency. Do we want them to come monthly? Could they be okay just to come three monthly or six monthly? We looked at which type of healthcare worker cater uh, uh, do these patients need to be seen by? Is that necessarily a, uh, a trained uh, healthcare worker or can that be a lay worker? Uh, and we tried to look at service location. Where could those services be provided? Are there certain services that could be provided at a community level, uh, avoiding that the patient needs to come to the health facility, which is three hours away? Huh? And all of this, of course, is based on what does that patient need? What do those stable patients on art need? Uh, so this exercise actually resulted in a number of different models that have been developed according to their context. Uh, so they were really context-dependent responses to the reality of, uh, uh, of patients. And we developed a number of models going from more health service uh, driven strategies to more patient uh, driven strategies and I'm going to talk a bit through the details of them later. But the main thing that they all have in common is that they actually try to de-link clinical consultation from art refill. So we try to see minimally what do these patients, stable patients on art need. They need to come once a year for a clinical consultation and, uh, and a viral load. Uh. And the refill, we want to de-link that from that yearly consultation. We're going to see how we can organize the art refill in an innovative way. So as I said, all these models are context adapted and based on uh, what patients actually need. Uh, and key in there as well as is that it's, it was also always a choice of a patient to enter in one of these models, uh, yes or not. Um, so a first model is what we call appointment spacing and fast track drug refill. So that's really a health service uh, a, a change in the system, change in the organization at the health facility, uh, which has been piloted in urban as well as rural contexts, where patients uh, come one to three monthly, uh, depending on the context, for their refill at an individual basis. So instead of queuing up like uh, this lady in the, on the first slide was doing, they go directly to the, to the pharmacy, they pick up their drugs, so they just wait in the queue to pick up their drugs, and in half an hour they can be out, they have their drugs in their pockets and they can, they can go home. Huh? So this drug refill is, is often done by lay workers, huh? and then they just attend yearly for their viral load and for their clinical uh, consultation. Uh, another strategy that was piloted in, uh, mainly in South Africa, uh, mainly in urban settings, is what we call adherence clubs. And that's actually a grouped strategy for art refill. So patients are grouped uh, by 20 or 30. Uh, they meet every two months at uh, the health facility or at a community venue uh, in certain cases. And this group is led by a lay worker who then actually distributes the drugs to them. Again, yearly, they come to the health facility for their, uh, for their consultation and for their blood drawing. But in between, they just get their drugs as a group. And again, it makes them spend maybe one hour and a half at the health facility or at the community venue to pick up their drugs instead of the, the eight or six or eight hours that they might spend there. Um, then a third strategy is what we call the community art distribution points, or in French also called PODIS. And as this has been piloted in 
uh, Kinshasa, uh, Congo, that's why we call it Podis. Um, that was in an urban setting where we provided this, uh, where patients come three monthly to a community art distribution point. So it's actually a network of people living with HIV who uh, man that distribution point. Uh, and at that place, patients can again go with their receipt individually. They get the drugs from that peer uh, person and, and can just walk uh, home. Um, again, yearly, they come for blood consultation and viral load. So you're going to see that always comes back uh, in the different models. And then the last, uh, a last one, oops, that gray thing wasn't supposed to be there yet, but community art groups is the last model that I want to present to you, which has mainly been, uh, been started in rural uh, areas, and it's in, it's in Mozambique, Tete province, where we first started doing that, where, again, patients can get refill from uh, changing from one to three monthly, depending on context, in group. So these are self-formed groups of patients who actually rotate uh, on a monthly or three monthly basis for drug pickup. So we meet in, in, in our village or in our community, and today, me, I'm going to be the representative to come and, and pick the drugs for uh, in the health facility for my group. And when I get back from the health facility, I distribute them to my other group members. So this is really a, a fully patient-led model. There's no paid lay worker. Uh, involved in that in the community and again these people come then yearly for their clinical consultation and and, uh, and viral load mm -hmm. you're going to see that the art refills differ along these models basically we've always been forced to follow the maximum duration allowed by the ministry of health uh, and in absence of viral load monitoring uh, we're actually using cd4 and patients have to come on a six monthly basis for blood drawing for cd4 uh, and their clinical consultation um, now, what, uh, what are the benefits for patients and for healthcare workers uh, across these models? Huh? First of all, I think, and most importantly, it reduces the burden for patients. Huh? As this uh, group member of a community art group in, in Mozambique said, the advantage of being in, in what they call a, a CAG is that you can do other small jobs when you know that there's somebody else who's going to pick up the drugs for you. Huh? So they can continue. Uh, uh, doing their the regular things they do in life and lead actually a normal life instead of going to a health facility once a month. Um, patients in Kinshasa uh, also showed us that actually the patient cost is far lower at these distribution points, so they spent far less time for art collection at those sites. They, they were out in 14 minutes uh, compared to the 85 minutes that they would spend at the regular uh, hospital they, where they were getting care. And their transportation costs were a lot less if they could go to these community distribution points, which were obviously a lot closer to their house. Mm? Uh, so costs were three times less at those distribution points. Um, what did we also see? Improved health outcomes. So this, uh, this graph is a bit dense, but basically the, the colored bars show the retention in care uh, for patients who uh, are in uh, uh, in these models. Uh. Of course, uh, follow-up time is different, so we have to be a bit careful of how we interpret this, but uh, it does show a general trend of high, high retention and care for patients who are in these models. And actually, the patterned bars show you how their peers, who, are, who have similar characteristics, but who chose not to be in such a model, are performing. And actually, their retention in care is, is, uh, is lower. Uh, you can see as, as much here in, in Mozambique, 77% retain in care with the same characteristics, but not in community art groups, comparing to 95%. Uh, so this actually shows better health outcomes for those who, who chose to be in these models. Another advantage, of course, uh, for, the, for the grouped models show that it increases peer support, which is, uh, and peer support in itself can be a motivator for adherence. So this patient in, in Mozambique also said, belonging to a group, it strengthens us, and moreover, being united, we feel mentally stronger during treatment, compares to those who have to deal with it individually. Uh, so the group allows them to tackle a few problems that they have difficulty in tackling on their own. Um, another advantage for the healthcare worker now is that it re reduces their workload. What does this graph actually show? In Malawi, we looked at uh, clinic visits of patients before we implemented community art groups versus after. Uh, and you see that there's a drop 
uh, a drop in these uh, in these clinic visits, especially for the art refill visits, reduced by 60%. So this means 60% less of those people that the healthcare worker needs to see. So that clearly speaks to the fact that if they come less often, that the healthcare worker also has less uh, less workload uh, and don't have to spend their time on these stable patients uh, on art. Um, then also we have we have uh, still few costing data, but in in Kailicha, South Africa, they did look at costing of these adherence clubs, and this actually shows that the cost per patient per year in these adherence clubs was 50, uh, 58 US dollars compared to the ones who who stayed in conventional care, which came at a cost of one hundred nine uh, US dollars. Um, so all in all, these models show a number of positive outcomes for as well patients as healthcare workers. But of course, we need to think of what is needed for these models to, to function in the long run and to be scaled up. Um, and this is, there's a number of critical enablers which we, which we identified. The first one uh, is this recognition of lay cadres, which we've already talked to this morning. But clearly, these lay counselors play an important role in facilitating uh, these models, ensuring that patients are aware that they exist, that they can enter in such a model or act on, on group problems which may appear or, or even uh, help in the, in the simple drug distribution. Quality access to quality clinical management needs to stay insured. Uh, I think we need to be very careful that if we engage in community-based art delivery models, it doesn't mean that we don't have to look at what happens at a health facility. So patients still need access to a quality clinical consultation. If there's any problem, they need to be able to be referred back to regular care. Re a reliable monitoring system is also needed just for health systems to be held accountable and also for us to be able to troubleshoot uh, uh, patients uh, who, need, who need further care. And of course, a robust drug supply is also needed. Uh, others have already talked uh, around uh, the stockouts uh, before, uh, so which definitely threaten these models as well. And all of that actually requires realistic planning and flexible adaptations to its context to be able to, to scale up at large. So in conclusion, I want to say that further scale up of art will demand us to look into innovative interventions and innovative ways of how to, to offer care to patients. And these differentiated care models do actually respond to a need of this growing cohort of stable patients on art and their healthcare workers. But of course, we need to ensure that a conducive national framework and national policy uh, is there to, uh, to ensure that these critical enablers are in place. So if you want to read more about this, I don't know if we took the report, it should be here somewhere, but this Reaching Closer to Home report definitely explains you a bit more in detail what I've just been, been talking about. And we also have a number of toolkits which help uh, countries and health facilities in, in scaling these models uh, up. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Please have a seat. So we're going to talk more about money and funding challenges. We have Dr. Michael Johnson with us, Head of Technical Advice and Partnership at the Global Fund. And you're going to talk about differentiated service delivery models. But first I want to ask you, because I know that the Global Fund had problems with funding over the last couple of years. How are you coping with today's challenges that we heard about here? Welcome. You like to start people off with easy questions. Huh? <laughs> I'm a journalist. It's yeah, my job. <laughs> so thank you very much. This is a fabulous uh, day and, and series of sessions. Um, it's fantastic to see all this experience in one place. I want to apologize right off the bat. I'm going to hang on closely to my water. I have a little bit of a, a cold thing going on. Somebody gave me advice one time. If you're feeling under the weather, go to Stockholm. But I think they were talking about in June. <laughs> not, not, not in December, but here I am anyway, so hopefully I'll make it through a few minutes. Um, I'm going to answer that question in the course, I think, of, of, uh, of what I say. Um, uh, there's, first of all, I guess I should get to the slides. How do I do that? Am I going the right? Yeah. Backwards. Keep going? There we go. Okay. Um, the, uh, for, for people that are experienced in delivering care in underserved areas, um, this is really um, obvious that we should be doing this, but for those of you that are not experienced in that, this seems like it should be obvious, but medicine is an incredibly conservative and slow-moving thing, and um, 
innovations are not easily adapted. And we have a long history, unfortunately, of issuing guidelines that are just cookie cutter, that everything should be done exactly the same for each patient. Um, six, uh, one to two month refills for drugs and HIV, DOT and tuberculosis. So we have a lot of things that have been done for years and years and years and considered quote unquote, the gold standard. And what you're hearing about is a movement that's being fueled by um, opportunity, and we've heard about that today, to mobilize resources to change the course of these epidemics, and efficiencies that need to be found because of budgets and where we're going with that. So I'll go through a few things that the Global Fund is working with partners, and not doing alone, to try to do. Um, so first of all, just a, a quick summary of the Global Fund investments over the years. And you can see considerable amounts, 28 billion invested as of August 2015. And uh, thanks um, to the government of Sweden, which has consistently been within the top 10% of the donors that create this pool of money. And it's not just money, this has led to, as of 2015, an estimated 17 million lives saved. And we estimate that by 2016, that'll go up to 22 million lives saved. So um, there's a lot of good work being done by all the partners. The challenges in front of us have been discussed earlier today. These are the disease plans in AIDS, TB, and malaria that all call for the possibility of control, um, not elimination, but you know, close to that, um, epidemic control, whatever terms one wants to use, by the time of 2030. But to get there, there's an initial investment that um, all three disease areas and their strategies are calling for based on a consortium of modelers and other um, sophisticated quantitative means to get to that estimate. So how do we deal with that? So within the Global Fund, um, if you just look at, the, I'll just take a, uh, um, for the sake of time, one or two points off each slide. If you look at the blue bar on the right, that's the estimated needs that the Global Fund and many partners are calculating for the next period of 2017 to 2019. If one goes with an estimate of roughly a similar replenishment in 2016, the Global Fund will have about 80% of that, uh, of that total. So the question is, how do we get to these ambitious goals of disease control with the same or less resources? And so it, we, we advocate and we, we appreciate your advocacy. We want more. Ultimately, we want to do more with more. And what you're hearing about today is a whole series of efforts to try to get to that point. So what we've started to do is uh, learn from many of the people that have presented here today um, with the hypothesis that in places of weak systems for health and weak health systems, uh, there are some shining lights out there. There are some places that are doing fantastic work to find efficiencies through very, very direct and in a way simple management um, approaches, not fancy new technologies sometimes, but at the core using data using data that's locally derived from patients. And again, we've heard a lot about that today, and I'll highlight a couple of those things. So what we've done is we've tried to go out and figure out, while we try to get to um, fantastic systems for health that we all aspire to, where are those places that are finding these workarounds, these very specific ways at the site level to work closer with communities and to change practices and ultimately to differentiate to find these efficiencies and qualities. So we've taken a look at health facilities and included in that communities. And we have uh, gone through a phase of discovery and we're trying to dis disseminate and package some of these practices with partners and ultimately demonstrate that they can be scaled up. So here uh, is how we started. We did uh, a, a lot of interviews, literature review, and some field visits initially to Kenya, Uganda, and Senegal, and it included uh, understanding more and learning from some of the work you've heard today from MSF and other partners. And so based on those observations and that formative work, like things like adherence clubs, like the greater engagement between facilities and communities, and very much based on data, program data, and also client data, uh, in these three countries, we visited a number of facilities to find out what they're doing and how they're going about doing this work. And so uh, out of that, we've um, synthesized some ideas, uh, again, with partners about differentiated, and I'd really focus on the top three there, one, two, three, differentiated approaches to screening and testing, treatment and care models, and drug dispensing models. Again, you've heard about those today. 
So I won't go into a lot of detail, except just to, again, reemphasize that this is based on, and it was really implicit in some of the presentations and not explicit, is it has to be based on data. It has to be based on qualitative data and quantitative data. So again, what you've heard today, which sounds obvious, like in any marketing first year business school, this is what you would do. In medicine, we haven't done this effectively. And so what you've seen today are examples of um, segmenting the clients, if you will, according to uh, gender, according to age, according to where they live, according to their health condition, their history of adherence, all those factors and others you've heard about. So we tried to collect what some of these sites are doing, and particularly I would focus on um, the aspect that has been emphasized today of gender, of marginalized populations, of human rights, but also practical things like distance and like whether the person has a job or not. And so these things have all been factored in, and this is an example which we haven't heard about today, but is certainly another great example of this at Tasso, where what they told us was, we didn't, we didn't start with this great innovation. We started with a budget that got cut and more patients we needed to see. So what did we do about it? So we had to segment our patients. We had to learn more about them. We had to change our practices to figure out which people, we've heard today about people coming in less often. There are some people that need to come in more often. There are some people that need double DOT. There are some people that need more intensive. We heard a little bit about it, but just to emphasize, it's not a cookie cutter approach. It's a differentiated care model based on local data. So what they've done is they've done exactly what we just heard some about. They've gotten into community drug delivery points and community-led ARVT delivery that gets closer to the home, and they've found efficiencies and increase in quality that both go hand in hand. And so as we have taken some very, very gross extrapolations from some of the models that we've examined. We've looked and made estimates without going into the details of those numbers about hundreds of millions of dollars that can be saved if this were done across the portfolio of where Global Fund supports. This is 10 or 20% improvements that are doing more with more. They're finding money in the system, using it more effectively, but also, as we just heard in the last presentation, getting better outcomes. So it's not just about cutting costs. So what we're doing right now is we're in a dissemination phase with colleagues in these countries, but particularly Kenya has taken this more aggressively. And they are working in um, remember 18 or 20 of their counties. They have a quality control officer that just came to Geneva last week to do a presentation at a collection of partners that are working on this area. And it's fantastic. They're out there um, putting together manuals because, it, again, you can't just issue a single guidance to say, here's what you should do. What you can do is issue a guidance to say, here's how you go about figuring out what you should do. And they're doing that in Kenya to adapt to their different situations. So this is just a, a quick summary of these three countries where we're supporting and working with colleagues to um, uh, develop approaches and, and um uh, analytical tools that will give clinic managers the opportunities to find some of the efficiencies and some of the improved qualities that you've heard about from some of the wonderful MSF presentations today. I didn't make a slide of it, but um, there was just a meeting last week. I want to emphasize just how um, MSF has been at the lead of this, uh, Tasso has been at the lead, some other individual places. But now we, there was a meeting last week that had Gates, IAS, MSF, WHO, World, which is putting out new guidelines in this area, World Bank, PEPFAR, and we're incorporating now um, tuberculosis partners because this is absolutely something that needs to be done among TB service delivery sites and not only HIV. And so again, we're, we're not, um, the Global Fund is not a technical agency, but what we do have is a leveraging power to incentivize this kind of practice and these kinds of behaviors uh, in countries. And I think, again, we, we've heard about so much of these pieces today, so I just want to go back to what a fantastic collection of presentations it was, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you, so thanks. You didn't have to stand up. I didn't even have time to switch on my microphone. Thank you very much. You can actually keep the microphone on and have a seat at the table okay. because uh, you're perf we're actually perfect on time, thanks to Dr. Johnson. And that means that we have a 15 minutes session now where we'll give time for questions. So please, raise your hands.
Hello? No, it's... Hello? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we can hear me. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Andreas Bergloff. I'm working with RFSU, the Swedish Association for Sexuality Education. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Johnson uh, about the country coordinating mechanisms, because that's where everything is sort of boiling down at the end, isn't it? And um, <coughs> friends uh, working or representing uh, organizations for people living with HIV who are not invited to the, to the CCM um, uh, meetings that occur uh, Moldova, Albania, for instance, here in, in Europe. What is your response to that and, and how, if that still occurs, how can we improve that? Thank you. Uh, yeah, please answer. Yeah, I think is this that's it's on now? Yeah, yeah it um, is. So thanks. Um, it's a it's a vitally important issue. Uh, as everybody knows, the CCM. Uh, most people, I'll just say it briefly for, for a few that may not. The CCM is is a, a global fund mandated body that is uh, legally responsible for the application and the management of the funding, and it by um, by its formation has to have public and civil society uh, and private engagement, and it's a tool for that. At the time of the major global fund. Uh, um, changes uh, that happened and led to the new funding model in 2011, 2012, everything was on the table for um, rejigging, redoing, reorganizing, and many things were. And we talked internally about the CCMs and what can and should be done to make them most inclusive. And um, to be honest, uh, th there are, there, there are uh, steps taken in terms of constituency membership and mostly this process of country dialogue where the fund portfolio managers take a closer look and are in country every month uh, examining that. But nobody could come up with a, something better than the CCM. So I would say the CCMs are um, variable, to be perfectly honest. And I think the fund portfolio managers in the countries that you mentioned uh, either do or should know about those things and um, engage with the other partners around the table to be sure there's there's the best representation. But the thing that's come into place is this process of country dialogue where CCMs are mandated to demonstrate that they're going beyond their own membership and that they are uh, including other voices in the preparation of concept notes. So when that's not happening, uh, we'd like to know about it and we can talk offline about whether that has or should be reported to who. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Uh, maybe you can, yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, just to say that we also find um, from CEDA's perspective and the Swedish embassies that sometimes partners, civil society organizations are not really aware of when uh, key processes are starting in, in countries like development of a concept note for, for the Global Fund, for example, which is extremely important, of course, to be part of. And there I think that sometimes uh, sh the sharing of information can be done through uh, actors like you here, uh, uh, NGOs working in the north who are aware that these processes take place, be in touch with your partners at country level to inform them and also ask embassies, your key donors, um, like-minded donors, inform them, look, there is an, an organization uh, for people living with HIV who have not even been at the CCM or who have not been invited. Why is that? You know, use your all your contacts to to uh, support or push the global fund to invite them. Hugely, I hugely emphasize that point about the political mobilization. Uh, what we, uh, what what I've said many times, and, and hopefully other people agree with the the the, w the global fund does not want wonderful donors like Sweden and the UK and France and Germany and the US and Australia and all the great donors. We don't want them to just write a check and go home. We want them to be active. We want the, we need that political mobilization. So thank you for saying that. It's super important. Thank you. And do we have any more questions? Is this like after lunch coma <laughs> or <laughs> question over there? Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, my name is Malaika Mikkelsen. I'm from Shifu Foundation. And I just wanted to say that I was very happy to hear Dr. Johnson talk about um, the importance of gathering data because uh, one of the, the gaps 
that we have in addressing the issue of HIV um, is the lack of, of uh, quality um, data that's not aggregated, but that is broken down to a very local level. And Dr. Ekstrom touched on this earlier as well, as well as P. Engstrand, in terms of strengthening health systems. And I think that it's something that ought to be remembered, even as we talk about the very lofty goals of, of reaching, for example, triple 90, um, that we have to do this within the local context of gathering um, uh, quality data. So I think that's a very important point that Dr. Johnson touched on. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. It's so, it's so important. I want to, sorry to talk too much, but um, I, it, it's absolutely important. And what I want to take your comment and extend even further, and, and I think it was emphasized in many of the presentations, is the use of that data. Because you're right, there, there's a lot more that needs to be collected, but there's also a, an unfortunate historical um, trend of uh, collecting data and reporting it up the chain. And then you get a nice, you know, uh, nice book that has a lot of facts and figures in it, and then it gets sent up to UNAIDS and all of that. What, what we're talking about today is the other side of that, which is how do you take that data, generate it, uh, analyze it locally, and how do we empower and, and support the capacity of individual site managers to do that? And again, we've heard about some of the models today, but it's not common. And so thanks for that comment, and I just want to even further emphasize into this whole cycle of collection and use, which is not often done. Thank you. Mr. I Bayek? agree and disagree. Indeed, we need data, but please keep them as minimal as possible, because what we happen, what happened to, to happen for usually is that donors, they need to be showing what has been done with their taxpayers' money, and basically they're going to ask a whole series of evidence and, 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 and data indicators filled in and basically this takes away the time of any health worker to spend qualitative time to clinically monitor the patients, uh, treat and diagnose uh, the diseases and so on. And basically this is a serious disbalance uh, sometimes about the, 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 the cumbersome uh, weight of data collection. What we need as data are four. How many were tested and have been linked to care? How many have been put on treatment? How many do come back continuously? And how many remain undetectable? These are the four data. But when you compare this to the number of the amounts, the mountains of, of, of data that are requested by, by international donors towards uh, governments, we're killing, we're killing the, 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 the investments. And, and this is underlying that i would say and in that sense maybe a sentence Sar didn't uh, stress enough in the um, in, in her presentation is about the demedicalization we need to make a difference between the people that need um, professional support medical support that are sick that have fever that have a disease and others that have only the need of having a drug supply so the 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 the, the, the cutoff between clinical care and drug supply. And drug supply should get out as much as possible from professional hands to be able to go as close as possible to people. And for this, of course, the, the closer we are in the periphery, the less data we will have. So let's be very careful and let's try to make, not anymore speak about patients, let's speak about people who need this damned drug to be as close as possible to their treatment, to their house. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bayet. I saw Malaika waving, but I also saw Anamia, so I'm gonna Allow Anamia first, and then you'll get the microphone back. So I also would like to agree and disagree with you, uh, Mark, on this uh, data issue. That uh, uh, I, I entirely agree that way too much time is spent by various is very scarce health workers to fill in multiple records. But that's I think all of that could really be simplified if donors managed to coordinate themselves you know and also if we could digitalize data then it could be one electronic system they all just using you know a handheld um, electronic ent data entering etc to make this automatic and i think we need that also to evaluate interventions because we roll out now numerous different we've seen here how many interventions that are being piloted and these must be evaluated uh, in terms of cost e effectiveness etc and sort of cost utility to to see what really we uh, countries with scarce resources should invest their scarce resources into and how to make priorities so we really need to use data and i would like to then uh, emphasize the need of uh, the existing for example community 
a data collection network called In Depth in terms of health and demographic surveillance sites. That are that it's an, organi an umbrella organization collecting data from 60 um, rural uh, sites with an average of 60,000 people in the periphery where nobody else collects data, and and that data. Is, has so far, as you say, data has been collected for reporting purposes and not for actual use, in, to not to be used. And I was recently at a meeting with the Ethiopian minister, ministers of health, and uh, they have several different ministers, and they said it's time we start collecting. They want, they're talking about a health data transformation, uh, data revolution is actually what the information revolution, I think, is the, is the word they use, which is very impressive, actually, to see how they want to use data much more locally and data to be collected locally and also used locally. And we, we're talking district level, even village level, perhaps, or health facility level, level. And that requires that data is timely collected, but also analyzed in a very, very simple manner, sort of graphically illustrated automatically by a digital program, for example, so that managers every uh, month can, for example, see how many patients, how many drugs, how much drug do we have in stock, how many are retained, how many have come back to pick up their drugs. And now it's so cumbersome to calculate all of this, so it's reported like three years later, to with huge investment of time, waste of time. And this this is something where research needs to go in also to see how can we make data collection and use much more effective, quick, timely, easy, sort of user friendly. I think that's it's really, really crucial for, for the future. Thank you. Alaika? I wanted to say that I completely agree with what you said, Mark, about the, the importance of contextualizing the data that we collect and what is it being used for and who is it being used by. And the process of data collection and um, touching on what you said just now, Anemia, about making data collection as easy as possible and as close as possible to the user uh, in the community, whether it's the patient or whether it's the health worker. And that's one of the things, sorry to make a shameless plug, but that's one of the things that we work. We create software so that data can be collected in a very simple automatic and direct manner, which frees up the nurses and healthcare workers from administration and report generation. So instead of spending four hours per day on administration and re creating reports that are lost in the system, the data is relevant and is collected what they need, when they need it, and to be used by the community. So I think that's a very, very important difference. Thank you. Uh, Lana Fjallmaker? Next to you. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just a quick remark, no, not a question. <laughs> and, and thank you to, to the Global Fund for the openness uh, in your reply to the question from Andreas. But, and also Pia already commented upon this. But I mean, these things are extremely important for us to hear. So thank you for bringing them up. And as you know, most of you, because you, you are so well educated on all this, <laughs> But, uh, you know, on the Global Fund Board, we work in a constituency called Point Seven, and right now it's Denmark who represent that constituency on the Global Fund Board, and the deputy board member is Norway, and then in the constituency is also Sweden and Holland and Ireland and Luxembourg. So if we look upon that constituency, we are represented with embassies quite at large. So we have possibilities to work on the ground. Sweden is not in all countries. We are in many countries in Africa. But if you look upon the constituency as such, uh, it is very much possible to work through the constituencies. So we can both work at the country level, but also on the board when we get to know things like this. And we also feel a, a great openness from the Global Fund when we discuss these things about CCM, for example, and how it works and how it does not work. So it's good that you bring it up, but also a good discussion here. Thank you. Thank you. And I think Kirsten Åkerfeldt had a question or a remark. We'll see. Yes, it is. Uh, it's actually it's a comment and a question. A comment uh, in response to something that Anamia mentioned around drugs and that we now have very very good drugs available and you mentioned that the medical bit is basically solved but I, I just want to challenge that a bit when it comes to access to newer medicines in countries in middle, middle income countries and um, maybe colleagues from South Africa can comment on how um, 
patent barriers are posing a threat to actually continue having access to those really good drugs in, in, in other countries than, than Sweden, for example. Um, but also when it comes to stockouts, this has been mentioned a lot. And I think that is, we all agree that it's, it's essential to have uninterrupted access to drugs in the clinics. And I also want to ask actually the Global Fund going forward with this approach on differentiated care, how much you see this um, this sort of line of supply, uninterrupted supply, um, also as your responsibility to ensure that in country clinics have, uh, and, and there's a beyond sort of the delivery at, at country level, that also in country drug supply chain is functioning. Please. Dr. Johnson. What, what's the, the answer of the afternoon is yes and no? Is that where he says? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I guess what I would say is it, it absolutely is our responsibility, it's the Global Fund's responsibility to make sure the money is spent wisely. And if, it's, if there's leaky supply chains, it's not being spent wisely. So that's clear, complete agreement. The, the problem or the, the challenge that we all need to work together on is the Global Fund is a partnership organization with no field staff and very, very limited technical staff in Geneva. So um, we, we need to be working, and we are working with partners in a lot of different ways to try to um, uh, detect and repair those problems when they exist. The best example right now that some of you, you might have to be pretty close to the Global Fund to be in the middle of this at this point because it's early on. But there's a fairly new initiative called Implementation Through Partnership, ITP, which for medical doctors is actually a blood disease, but that's a different story. And um, it's a, um, a preliminary approach that I think will grow and become part of the way we normally do business of analyzing the financial um, utilization because it's an early marker for for weak implementation and finding and identifying countries that seem like they might be at risk of both initially um, underutilizing funds that are allocated and ultimately um, falling short on impact. And as we've convened in the last six weeks, 20 uh, country meetings with um, at least 10 to 20 to 30 partners each for each of those discussions, uh, one of the areas that comes up more uh, emphatically than most of the others is procurement and supply chain. And so there have been each of those 20 country meetings has been followed up or is being followed up with a country visit uh, with partners around the table, with CCMs, with PRs uh, and government to say, okay, here's what we all think are some of the big bottlenecks and here's um, a plan that we will work on together with mutual accountability and mutual <coughs> visibility for how we approach that. And I think supply chain is, is at or near the top of that list. So it's, it's definitely something that's on the radar screen. And so it gets back to the yes, no. It's our responsibility to be engaged in that and to support the things that need to be supported. But we can't do that without partnerships. And so this ITP is a, we're very excited about it, um, a more formal way to, to, to do this with partners. Thank you. And if you have any more questions, keep them. Because we are now, uh, very soon, going to have a break. And then we'll come back for a panel debate with three of you, uh, Anna, Mia, Pia and Michael, and also Mark Bayert <coughs> and uh, Sibon Gile, Chavalala. Uh, and just before the break, uh, we actually, I'm told that we've managed to get hold of the different soundtracks of the short film. Uh, from the Lake Councillor Project. So if anyone want to go out, you can do that. But otherwise, we're going to show it to you now with the correct sound. So you will once maybe get a better image of what the project with lay councillors in Kwasula Natal is. And uh, we'll be back at uh, uh, half past two for the panel discussion. Let me see if I can get the light down here. <laughs> it's very exciting to see whether it works or not.
When our project started uh, in 2011, uh, in all clinics that we are working with, we find that all patients have high viral load. No one was cancelling clients in terms of their viral load results. They will take blood, but the results won't, won't be given to them. I mean, people, they need to be reminded why they are on ARVs. Some people start ARVs while they are very sick, and when they get better, they tend to neglect their treatment. What I like the most about my job is being able to help the clients tell their story and be able to be open about what they feel they stop because they get to, into new relationships. They stop because they found a new job and they are unable to keep to the time when they're going to take their medication. So when we do enhance adherence, that is kind of reminding them of why did they start treatment in the first place. They will tell you because I want to see my children going to college, I want to be healthy. If you have these goals, how are you going to achieve them if your viral load is high because now you're going to get sick and you're not going to be able to reach your goals? And I think that is helping them a lot because we see improvement after doing it. default <laughs> Okay, so we we'll see you at 2.30.
yeah, yeah. <laughs> the the elite is still in the room. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. Is uh, the camera rolling? Yeah, it is. So now we're gonna have a panel debate, and uh, I just want to start with saying that for me, one of the most amazing things that's been said here today over and over again is that we actually now have this window of opportunity that there is a real chance of, of actually ending the AIDS pandemic if everyone works together and with full strength. And I've done, as I told you during the day, I've done so many stories on HIV AIDS. I've visited villages in Malawi where a generation is missing. The generation was supposed to work, the ones that were going to cultivate the land. And uh, I mean, you all seen this as well, but I've visited the child-headed households, meeting the children who have no adult uh, relative alive anymore and are just left for themselves. And I think that if we have a true, a real opportunity now to do something that will end this for the future, it's amazing. And therefore, I want to start uh, uh, to ask you in the panel to, to talk about what is needed to change, to actually reach the goal. Because the way the curves that we've been looking at now, they have been going in the right direction. But if I haven't misunderstood everything, some things actually looks like if they're starting to go a little bit, indicating that they might be going the wrong way again. And how, what do we need to change to keep it the right way? And, and to reach the 1990-90 goal that we have been talking about. Uh, so I would like each of you to talk two, three minutes briefly on this. What needs to change to reach the goal? And I want to start with Sibongila. Um, <coughs> I think we need to change the uh, way of reporting, of reporting our data and the accountability especially with uh, government officials. Uh, we need uh, I I I accountability, you know, it will assist the information to flow down to, 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 community, to communities and it will assist uh, civil society to be able to respond in some issues and it will assist the government to know where to, to tackle the issues. And we need to change the way uh, 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 ARV supply, it's been, it's been done. Recently in, in South Africa, we, for a few months, we've been uh, seeing a, a shortage of alluvia. And this, it, it, it was because of alluvia, it's done, it's, it's only contributed, it's only distributed by one company of which it's, 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 it's patented. And it's under, it's, it's, it's been given a, a, a license of 20 years of which it will be ending by 2010. So any gener uh, other companies, they cannot make generic uh, uh, alluvia to be available in the country and when when this one supply is in shortage of, of, of medication then the whole country struggles to get to get to access one medication so the change of doing things I think it will assist us to reach the 1990 goals thank you dr. Michael Johnson from the global fund No, I don't think it's on. I think you have to sit. This one. This one. <coughs> yeah. Do it? yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, simple question. Um, <laughs> I, I You're supposed to have the answer. Yeah. You? Right. I, I guess. I mean, it, it's. I think the things that are needed have been said today, and I think it's. That's why I em emphasized when I spoke earlier. What a exciting and fantastic collection of. of uh, discussions and presentations. I, I guess if I'm sort of stepping back and saying, okay, out of all these really big things, um, what comes to mind? Uh, uh, clearly, the the funding, so the advocacy piece, um, has to be there. Uh, yeah, I, I would boil it down to three key things. I'd say the the advocacy and and, and the funding to to get the resources there. I would say we've talked a lot today about um, what uh, one might call. Uh, resilient and sustainable health systems so in relation to the medical model. We've talked a lot about um, that the traditional medical model is not one that's built 
for um, this kind of service delivery. And so we need to be, uh, again, we heard today about changing the, the ways of follow-up, changing the um, engagement with communities, um, uh, collecting and using data locally, um, th those sort of things. And then the third is related to that last point. What you just said is I think that the, the, there's such a history that is so difficult to overcome of collecting data and not using it. And so the last session we had a discussion about how much should there be and should we collect too much, too little. I think it's what do we use? You know, what, what do we actually use for transparency, for accountability, for communities and, and uh, service providers to be able to know how to find those efficiencies and target the program. So in summary, I guess I'd say funding um, the new models of, of, of delivery and, and um, community engagement in that and, um, and data and accountability. And I guess, y and, and you have to put in human rights because of the, you know, the, the um, stigma issues are um, overwhelming and, and will always get in the way until we make progress on that. Thank you. Pierre Stan from SIDA. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so I have also written down three uh, issues, not to duplicate what has already been said. I think, of course, the first one, there will be a duplication from all of us, I'm sure, that is to maintain funding levels to get um, the best possible funding uh, over the next five years. That's absolutely essential. Uh, related to that is, of course, the fact that I, I see that the Global Fund and UNAIDS have really moved in the right directions over the last years. Uh, we are seeing the Global Fund uh, being much more uh, active in the area of human rights, really uh, putting funding into human rights programming, which is essential, uh, much larger focus also on gender equality within the global fund funded uh, programs. So that's good. In terms of UNAIDS, I think we also saw the new strategy, um, which now includes m uh, a heavier focus on prevention. Um, the release uh, of the 1990-90 was extremely important, I think, and from the Swedish perspective, but at the same time, I and many more were a bit concerned that they didn't release anything like that for prevention. So I think the new uh, strategy is, is absolutely right and doing the right thing just now. Uh, so funding, maintain the funding. The second one is comparative advantages. I think we can improve efficiencies, uh, not least the multilaterals. Uh, there is a lot of duplication from the UN agencies and there can be uh, efficiency gains by uh, having better coordination at country level, who does what and, and really letting the actors do what they are good at. And the last one is around gender equality uh, and focusing on adolescents. Uh, th those are uh, the, the young generation, the window of opportunity. Uh, we have to improve uh, gender equality among uh, young boys and young women. That's the way to go. Thank you. Mark Bayet from MSF. Yeah, just maybe seeing the same, uh, but from the other angle. Um, I think key into that and what we learned in the now one and a half decades of HIV fight is to really um, looking at this chronic treatment from a patient perspective. I think if we can achieve that, then we'll, we'll tackle most issues for the ultimate goal is that the patients adhere and are remaining undetectable. Otherwise, yeah, remaining undetectable is the key um, condition to get this epidemic, em epidemic down because by this we will decrease the, 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 the spreading of the virus. So basically um, when, when you see the difficulties that are encountered uh, by governments, too much still uh, systems are analyzed top down or only by for systemic problems by the managers, how to improve the life of the managers, how much it costs to the system, to the managers, how should they be able to have a bigger efficiency. 
and we forgot the patient perspective. I'm thinking about the stockouts, what we recently spoke about, and we are coming with a report now on ICASA from tomorrow onwards, uh, by which we realized that basically, yeah, we, we, we have a kind of good overview and of the stockouts until the district level. But we forget that we, in fact, usually don't have, or very rarely have information on the last mile, how many of the patients do access treatment, just because maybe there is no car going from the district uh, warehouse to the health center. The drugs are in the district, but they didn't reach the health center. Um, looking at the patient perspective, how to access treatment, how to adhere on treatment, will help us, like it was happily said uh, today already, to, to have a tiered approach, to have a differentiated approach according to the conditions. If you're an intellectual city dweller, and of course you need to adhere differently, and you will adhere differently as compared to a labor or a farmer far away in a peripheral district. Let's adapt, let's destandardize our approach according to the reality of the patient and usually as well on the lowest level nurse. This will help you to understand that we shouldn't ask her half of her time to fill in data, <laughs> but ke ke keep on the, the focus on the quality care. But of course we need some data, more often even, not so much for system or, uh, management issue, but for her to understand where she is, what the quality she is providing, he or she is providing, and, and what she has to focus on as a priority for the next month. So I think keeping that eye on, challenging the, 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 th the drives for efficiency, for, for coverage, uh, by looking at to the quality and, and the patient perspective will, will help us forward. Thank <coughs> you. And Anamia? Um, <laughs> sorry. Should I? I think... Um, so I agree, of course, with all of the uh, previous speakers. But to add then, if we look at these three, 90-90-90, the first one is to have 90% of those living with HIV knowing their status. And this is where we fall short. This is our main you know, uh, shortcoming because we, all, we only have 20 out of the 37 million people living with HIV knowing their status. And obviously that's the main barrier since we know we can't reach, the treatment prevention only works if everyone's on treatment, sort of. And, and uh, we know that more than half of those who are newly infected are infected by somebody who doesn't know they're HIV positive or who are recently uh, infected. And that's the problem. You can never reach those who are recently infected in la the last you know, two, three weeks. They can, we can never reach them with treatment as prevention because they haven't, th so, so we need to also talk about prevention, what Pia mentions, uh, and risk behaviors, obviously, especially among, uh, in the areas that where people are most affected is among young women. So, so we need to talk about that too. So I would like the 1990-90 also in terms of prevention and some sort of, you know, uh, uh, similar strategy for, for prevention because treatment is prevention is important and extremely good for stigma because it, it gives people a, you know a, a an incentive to go get tested that we have this fantastic treatment but we it doesn't it's not a magic bullet and we need to remember that most people are infected uh, in a window that's not covered by that strategy so that's what I thought was important and therefore reaching out with t testing in terms of community-based testing household testing self testing, uh, adolescent adapted, you know, attractive, like the outreach testing tracks I is so important. And also because it creates awareness. And even if uh, knowing that you're HIV negative is extremely important too, because then you get feedback, okay, maybe I've been doing something right, or maybe I've just been lucky. And sort of how do I protect myself a and keep myself negative? In a way, we did a household uh, qualitative study among household uh, in a community based household testing in Kosul and Natal, and it turned out that those who were um, currently negative that was also a very you know positive feedback okay we're in this now and we can support each other to remain negative those were concurrent uh, couples that were concurrently positive also sort of uh, stuck together we're in this together but where the and where the man was positive the woman would usually stick with him uh, if she even if she was negative to support her but in couples where the woman was positive and the man was negative it was even hard to find these couples because when they had found out that they were discordant, they, in, they were HIV discordant, but the woman was positive, they would split up. So this is, you know, the woman, the, you, you shoot the messenger, sort of the, the one who first tests positive, you sort of assume there was this general assumption that you've been recently infected also, that you've been unfaithful in your current relationship, which is usually not the case, you know. So sort of the idea that I if the man is negative, it means that the positive woman must have been recently infected. And that, you know, because they, they sort of thought that the risk of infection transmission was so high, but we know that people can live together for years without, you know, infecting your partners if 
if you have a low viral load, even if you're not on treatment. So I think that sort of these misconceptions are dangerous because they put the blame on the positive partner in terms of I'm faithfulness and it prevents people from, from, from testing together. Couple testing is a complete failure, for example, really. It really doesn't work. I think very few uh, would go and test with your partner, even among, I, I'm a highly educated, well-paid uh, woman uh, uh, that I can, I can, <laughs> I can survive without my husband's financial support and I can support my children. Uh, and, uh, but uh, for many women, that's not the case, but even I wouldn't go test with my partner. You know, I would like to find out myself first and deal with it myself. And we have this sort of very romanticized uh, fairy tale idea that couples will always stick together, that you only have one partner, only one choice, you stick together no matter what. It's, it's complete bullshit, you know, it doesn't, the world doesn't work like that. <laughs> not even in Hollywood movies. I think we need to sort of adapt <laughs> our policies to, to reality. And uh, s for some people it might work, for most people it don't work. Thank you, and for you who've been working like from the researcher yeah. perspective, but also been on the field, uh, like we saw your slide on uh, two to teen track uh, before, what would you say, what would you like to see NGOs or donors or like the Global Fund, I are there anything that you would say well, approach from this side as well, like stop the fairy tale Hollywood thing, or, or like, do you have some advice? You need an incentive to test, really, you know, and now it, we have the treatment, which is good. It is not the death sentence to test, because then obviously very few wanted to get that death sentence and live with that. Now at least you can offer treatment, but I think to come out with the fact that treatment is so good, I I've mentioned that before, it's extremely important to reduce stigma. that And it's like a chronic condition like any, other condition I think is important. I would rather be, if the stigma was not there, if it was only for medical reasons, I would much rather live, be living with HIV than with diabetes, for example, because medically it's much more beneficial. The, prog uh, the prognosis is much better. Mm. The medication is much better and much easier. So it's all about stigma, really. It's all about lack of knowledge. And I, Shashtin told me that she challenged me that I said the medical re thing is, is solved. I actually said that, you know, for first, um, that it's difficult and very expensive to, to, to access second and third line treatment in low and middle income settings. And that is a big problem still, mm. because the drugs, even the first line drugs are way too expensive for most governments to be able to afford themselves. So that is really an issue that we need to deal with. And, and I think it's mainly through primary prevention to prevent resistance from happening even by supporting adherence because you can have a little resistance and still the first line drugs work. I have many, many patients with, you know, they resist most of my patients are have some sort of drug resistance, but it's not, it's minor, it's not that important. You know, it's not like either or black or white. If you have drug resistance, the medicines don't work, they still work you know, to some, to, to good enough. You if know? you get it, I guess, I, I think Pia was yeah. first, because we also heard Sibon Gile talking about the lack <coughs> of medicines right now in, in South Africa. Pia. One thing that I would like to see uh, being scaled up is use friendly services that we haven't talked very much about here today, unfortunately, but uh, one thing that we see now is that comprehensive sexuality education is, is actually now moving into schools again after a number of years with uh, the PEPFAR, the first PEPFAR program, there were substantial cha changes being made at curricula in many African countries, unfortunately. And uh, what used to be sexuality education, life skills education, seemed to dwindle away. And, and that was very unfortunate because tha that's needed, of course. And now there is increased interest from, from uh, ministries of education, ministries of health, to really see that change and comprehensive sexuality education coming back to schools in African countries. So that's a good thing. But the next step will then be to link that education to services as well, because without that link, <coughs> it's difficult. Young people need also to be referred and know where to access uh, contraceptives, condoms, uh, more education, more support around HIV, for example. So. And how to do that? How to strengthen that link, would you say? 
Uh, again, it's a question about uh, policies uh, being in place to allow for those centers um, or teenage clubs or whatever we call them to exist. Uh, it, it's also a behavior change, attitudinal change of, of parents, not least, who many times are not so positive to their young, uh, to <coughs> their um, uh, children and youth accessing those services so that requires a lot of changes at many different levels at the same time but i'm i'm positive that it's moving now um, the the sexuality education in schools is the first step thank you mark i think oh, yeah, so. no, yeah, sorry, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah so as, as my uh, neighbor here uh, started to say a bit some controversial not controversial but maybe some uh, stronger words on, on some topics i would like also to, to be a bit stronger on <laughs> some points or less diplomatic uh, i think we are also fooling ourselves into accepting that with the sustainable development goals health will be addressed and hiv will be addressed correctly throughout all the different uh, chapters of the sustainable development goals uh, streamlining hiv services will kill the advances that we have had up to now it's just too early it's just too early councillors are i think in one country except one country they are not yet established as a government uh, a worker uh, in most mohs um, civil society is very weak because they still are depending too much on donor money and now that the donors are withdrawing we don't see the government starting to pay for them why would they pay for them they have so many costs for maintaining their system upright and potentially these civil society organizations might be politically different have a different opinion on on health care and maybe uh, make a difference during the next elections so and also the, the 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 distribution systems are much too weak as well so basically for me it's somewhere just too early. We have made substantial uh, change, uh, changes and, and, and uh, wins, but, but the system is not ready yet to already now start being weaned off. And I think I'm very concerned. I'm a usually over-optimistic person, but I'm just very much concerned that we are going to see a withdrawal from all the gains very quickly because we are putting it now in a different uh, financing uh, support system by which uh, there are no um, uh, watchdogs or critical uh, conditions that will oblige countries to keep in mind these critical enablers. Michael from the Global Fund, you're getting most of the money to the Global Fund to battle AIDS. What do you say? Do you agree with Mark? Um, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess what I would say is y y yes, we have to keep a focus. Um, yes, we, ha I mean, for example, it came up a lot today, uh, which I thought was totally appropriate. I can't remember which presentation. There's so many good ones, but it was uh, around geographic prioritization, um, intervention prioritization, you know, making sure the resources go where the epidemic is, make sure it's focused and we stay on it. And so from that point of view, I completely agree. I guess the part I would, I would moderate a little bit or, or, or broaden a bit is w we do have to figure out how these um, vertical programs um, inter integrate and interdigitate, not, not to the point of losing focus, but we have to figure out how we, we create synergies because all of these things we just talked about around data, around community models of care, around, around you know, all, all these things are entirely applicable for other areas too. And so we have to figure out how to strike that balance. And I don't know what that balance is, but, but that's, so we put out a, um, a position paper, if you'd call that, or a policy paper, I don't know what you call it, on resilient and sustainable systems for health. It came out in the summer and it is, um, it highlights some of these areas that we think um, need to be in place. The Global Fund doesn't invest in all of them primarily, others do, but we need to be working with the others that are concerned about the systems for health. Thank you. Sibungila, what, what do you think? You, you, talk, you speak about the situation on the ground, about lack of medicines, about governments not doing enough, or the South African government not doing enough. I should also say that MSF has been struggling to get a representative from the South African government here, uh, also for a video link, but it was not possible due to the INCASA and the International AIDS Day tomorrow and so on. But what, what would you say? What, what kind of actions would you like to see from yeah, um, <coughs> as other speakers have said, mm. uh, testing remains essential 
for our AIDS response. And it's uh, important. It's important to include a, a, a testing in the 9090 strategy because while we are testing, you'll be able to get more people who will know their status. May and as as we we, we know that tomorrow they'll be announcing the the the. the the rollout of air uh, rollout of air to everyone who's HIV positive, irrespective of is it for count. But then we are still worried as a civil society if we have stockouts now. What will how what plan they do the government have in place to 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 maintain the the, 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 the people who are uh, on ARVs to be on treatment or to adhere because we have these goals that as South Africa we have uh, agreed that we, we are going with uh, like the 1990 strategy but if we continue to have uh, stockouts like we do have a stockouts of alluvia and people were taken back to first line regimen while some of them they they, they have res they, they have drug they have a uh, drug resistance because uh, regimen one was not responding to their immune system so those people it was like they were given water instead of given a, 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 a essential medicine that is right for for, for their, their 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 immune system and on the issue of uh, the statistics you know the data uh, and accountability you know I, I would like to stress that because we feel that in uh, um, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, detailed information and numbers will help us to know how many people are being tested and the percentage of people who are tr in treatment. And if I'm not mistaken, it was Anna Maya who talked about the linkage be between the people who who, who, were te who tested and who, who are on treatment. We in, in South Africa, we are we are lo losing people in, in in between. As I've said earlier, that in Gauteng, we lost thirty percent of people who are who, who are taking a, yes thirty yeah, percent uh, in Gauteng in mm -hmm. province alone. So <clears throat> of which that means there is something that is not right, and we cannot f follow up these people because some of them because of stigma and discrimination they are giving out wrong address, and because of uh, demarcation, you know, there's this thing of demarcation in in our country where you have to access a treatment nearer to your to your uh, area while people do, don't feel like going there because a lot of neighbors are going there in that clinic. So because of stigma, a person would prefer to go to another clinic where she's far away. And that will compromise the patient again because that patient, if she doesn't have money to go to that clinic, she won't be able to go. If she, maybe that person is not working, she'll only prioritize to take that money and buy bread or a millimeter for, 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 for kids instead of going to take treatment. So. That uh, takes me to the issue of lay councillors, of which, as an organisation, we feel that phasing out of lay councillors it will be problematic in our country because these lay councillors are doing a great job of taking medication to the people and to follow up uh, uh, patients at their homes. And sometimes they go extra mile by giving something out of their own pocket with the little money that they are earning to give that to that patient. So if lay councillors are taken out of the system, then will mean it will mean we won't reach the 1990 strategy by 2020 and we won't be able to reach the, uh, uh, to, to end AIDS by 2030. And we saw in the film here just uh, before the break how, how several people w were uh, telling how they were actually wouldn't have taken their medicine if they hadn't had the support from the lay councillors. But we also hear now that South African government is cutting down on the Monday on funding for the lay councillors. Just briefly, what, what would you like to see from the rest of the international community, from donors, Global Fund, NGOs? What can be done to, to change that? Support, uh, uh, approach from the South African government? Um, I would like to see uh, everyone in the world to sub, uh, supporting lay councillors. Uh, we have a case in Free State of which all uh, 179 uh, lay councillors were, were phased out, were retrenched from their work and because of that they, they, they had a civil disobedience uh, action outside of the, of the 
offices, uh, MEC's offices, and they were all arrested for fighting their rights. And we lost the case because treatment action campaign section 27, MSF and other partners, we are on this, assisting these community health care workers. And we lost the case recently at court because the government, you know, politician and some juridical system, they have that interrelationship. Or So we, we lost the, 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 that case. But then we are taking case forward. We are appealing to the High Court, you know, Plumfontein High Court, of which we we, 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 we think there we will manage to, to win that day because these people, they haven't violated any, any, any person's rights. They haven't vandalized anything. They were just there to demand their work back because some of them, they were being volunteers for almost 15 years and without earning anything. Now, because the, the government is phasing out these old uh, 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 lay councillors, they want to do a cadre deployment of which they want uh, people with qualifications to come and work as lay councillors in some areas, that will compromise the work. And how about these women who are working, or men who are working uh, and unpa unpaid, uh, assisting communities? Now they are taken out because they don't have metric. You know, they want qualifications now, of which some people will come with no uh, passion of this work. At the end of the day, we'll see more people dying of HIV and AIDS. Thank you. Michael, what, what is the Global Fund's approach to the system of lay workers, lay, uh, lay councillors? Do you work with that at all? Could you work with it? Is that an option? Uh, yes, there are many countries that do. The, the Global Fund receives applications from countries that stress their priorities. So we don't have a quota or a, a mandate to do one or the other um, as, as long as it passes the review of the technical review panel and the, and the grant approvals committee. Um, but having said that, um, there is very substantial investment, and I should remember the number, I, but I can't, but it's, it, it's uh, within the um, range of things that are health systems investments, it's the second largest, I think. And so um, th there, is, um, there are a lot of countries that have proposed that. Um, it's crucially important, and at the same time, the whole area of human resources for health is a very, to be frank, it's a scary one because there's such great needs out there. And the entire global fund could be about supporting human resources. And that's something, obviously, we can't do, but we need to figure out how to do that with partners, with host governments, with co-investments, et cetera. So we're, we're hugely supportive, uh, and we have it in a lot of the grants that countries have approved. Thank you. Mark? Building on that, so we had in April this year a big meeting with seven um, countries meeting, uh, sending their MOH uh, Minister of Health representatives and then joining with World Bank uh, responsibles, Global Fund responsible and a few other donors. And basically, yeah, we, we addressed this issue about the councillors. <coughs> I think now we, we won that battle now after 15 years, I think, and myself having been engaged heavily in Mozambique to try to convince governments that they need other people than only purely medically technical trained people. Their acceptance is there. The recognition is there. The problem is, is they are not integrated within the payroll or they are not integrated within the, the, um, the system of the ministries of health. Then when you come to that point, you address the issue with the ministries and they say, yeah, but we don't have enough money. We don't receive enough money or there are uh, ceiling caps above the number of people we can recruit in, in official uh, statements and that's uh, in official positions. And that's due to then Ministry of Finance implica uh, obligations towards uh, uh, IMF. IMF is approached and IMF says clearly these ceiling caps don't exist anymore since 2005, so we should not anymore imply them, but it's, they have trained everybody to use these ceiling caps to impose limitations on the human resources they use in, within the public systems, be it health, be it agriculture and so on. So I think in there then we really have a kind of, again, this, this vicious circle by which we need to give an empowered Ministry of Health to be able to ask uh, for their rights to have the necessary workforce. In Mozambique, for example, it's current practice that people uh, start in the Ministry of Health as a secretary, as an administrative responsible, earning little but getting experience. And after two, three years of public service as an administrator in Ministry of Health, for example, they can apply for the same job in the Ministry of Finance and get double of the salary. So basically, the, the, it's the empowerment of the Ministry of Health as well that prevents Ministry of Health from asking for um, the, the, the human resources they really need. 
approaching then the donors and then asking them, okay, but what about you? You can deny the quality of an imp uh, the impact on the quality that the um, councillors may uh, introduce and bring into treatment when people are empowered and educated. And they will say, yes, fine, but show us now the costing evidence. And this is where then I start feeling frustrated <laughs> because somewhere do we, do, do we again, okay, economy and, and is a reality and, and we need to somewhere um, live into a resource, uh, how limited uh, world. Uh, but on the other hand, I think also, and that's why I think with, uh, as NGOs and as medical professionals, we need first to look into and put central the, re the, the, the needs, the, 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 the demands, and then basically uh, address these issues according to what we need, not according to what we have in the pockets. Thank you. Uh, Pia, you told us before how you're not, you cannot do bilateral, bilateral uh, agreements with South Africa due to... Uh, but what do you think? Wh what about the system with lay councillors and how does CEDA work with that or if at all or with organisations? <coughs> I, I can't really say very much about it. I'm, I'm not into that level. You know, we support no. MSF, we support mm. other partner yeah. organisations who for sure works with lay councillors, but mm. I mean, we're coming from yeah, another MSF. level. Yeah. But you heard about it today, and, and you understand yes. also, I guess, the problem when we hear Silly uh, uh, <laughs> telling us how, how, how the numbers of lay councillors decreases mm. in the worst affected area of HIV AIDS in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, as other speakers have said, the challenge when it comes to human resources in health is enormous. And from our perspective, we hear a lot about task shifting. But as Anna Mia said, I think it's sometimes talk about, you know, just dumping work at somebody else. It's really, uh, there are important cases that have worked very well when it comes to task shifting. Midwiferies, for example, taking on important job uh, that doctors, medical doctors previously had to do and so on. But it really has to be evidence-based and, and really uh, worked through how you will do it. One other thing that I, I wanted to comment on is um, the importance of strong ministries of health that you talked about. I think two countries that have done well, very well uh, over the last years when it comes to improving the health of their people are Ethiopia and Rwanda, two e examples where the ministries of health are extremely strong and they have known what they wanted and they have demanded things from the Global Fund and other donors. They have been in charge. They have said, we want funding for this. You know, uh, I think you can correct me, but they were one of the first countries to s tell the Global Fund that we want uh, funding for our uh, health sector plan in general, not uh, aid specific, you know. And, and those are the examples that uh, we have to bear in mind and really support the ministries of health to be in charge. Uh, and, and, and somebody asked me about uh, donor requirements on reporting and data. And I don't want to be bragging, but Sweden and CEDA uh, always have the preferred mode of support to a partner is core support. We want to support a, a, an organization's entire plan strategy, and we don't want to support on a project basis asking for specific uh, project reporting data, just to, to emphasize that. Thank you. I also want to ask if there are any questions among you. <laughs> we have a few minutes for questions, if there are some. Or if there are, please interfere. Is there anything else that you want to... Yep, Anna Mia? Right, because uh, as you said, donor have request, donors have requests uh, in terms of reporting on how the money is used but i think donors could also and also the global fund could could demand sort of that governments use evidence based decision making in terms of what what how they how they consider their human resources and i'm thinking that it is actually now the studies are coming out showing that for example 
community health workers could do 80% of what PMTZD nurses do. There is evidence that outcomes aren't compromised when community health workers do counseling and testing. There is the evidence now that, you know, that this is also cost effective. So, and I think uh, Ethiopia, for example, is emphasizing that they want to, to be make evidence-based decisions. Uh, while South Africa, obviously, when, when re cutting down on, on the lay counselors, are, are going the other way. They're doing the opposite. They're not using the evidence that is there, that this is both cost effective and doesn't compromise outcomes. So if you claim that people need to be trained and have, you know, the from formal credentials to do this sort of work, you, you're, you're not using the evidence that it uh, that is out there. And I think that is quite serious. Donors should be concerned about that, that government, they're, they're funding governments or organizations that aren't using evidence for, for evidence-based you know, re and research that is out there for decision making, and that that is quite serious, actually, that that's accepted at all. And so the civil movement should also protest against that. So the South African government, you're not using the evidence that is there. You're making decisions based on what you know, mm -hmm. ideas that aren't based I in research, and that that's very serious. Public funding is used the wrong way. Should we demand more of the middle-income countries' governments? Definitely, yeah. Mark. <laughs> uh, yes, we should certainly demand more, but uh, also with, uh, how would I say, taking into consideration uh, what the population can pay for. So not only looking at the macroeconomic uh, conditions of a country, just like Mozambique is going to in one or two years' time probably to also uh, become a middle-income country, but the population's economic reality didn't change since uh, the end of the, the civil war. So basic, no, that <coughs> may, may be exaggerating, but maybe at least in the, the beginning of the <laughs> 2000s. Uh, so, but then in that sense, I think if it is not linked to, um, how would I say, internal, uh, well, I think it was said this morning, uh, tax rep, uh, the taxpayers' uh, redistribution and, and, and the capacity of the people to pay. I'm afraid that we will uh, fool each other again with macroeconomic reality and, and not with population's uh, capacity to pay for services. Thank you, Pia. Should we demand more from the middle-income countries' governments in yes. this? I think... <coughs> Please use the microphone. Yes, I would say so. Uh, Are you willing to do that? Yes, um, if I am willing or if we, SIDA, is willing, I think uh, Sweden and SIDA have a responsibility wherever we are active through our partners to, to be informed, to stay informed about what works, as, as you're saying, what is evidence, if is evidence based in programming. If not, of course, we have to ask questions. Uh, but then also, uh, I mean, we have to uh, accept our role and and really play our utmost role where we are most active and where we have most funding. So, for example, at the bilateral level, national level, in in our partner countries, that's where we have most staffing, most resources, and that is where most of our dialogue takes place. Michael. Well, I guess I would divide that into um, financing and policy. They're, they're two related things, but not exactly the same. And th the Global Fund has a, a, a very aggressive um, counterpart financing policy that has raised um, upwards of a couple hundred million dollars um, in addition to um, what had been raised before through that mechanism. And I, uh, the, the strategy committee and the board are still um, deliberating on what the new allocation model will look like, but I would imagine that that will be something that gets emphasized. Um, from a policy perspective, um, we certainly, um, as, as was said, um, need to respect and follow the closest science and the TRP, the Technical Review Panel, and the GAC, the Grant Approvals Committee, aim to do that. Uh, there's a lot of gray zone. You know, there's a lot of situations where it's not clearly against it, not clearly with, and so that's where we need partners. We need partners to come to the table and work with us. Uh, this is an HIV crowd, but we've had a, a, a great deal of success in Eastern Europe recently working on TB hospitalization rates where tuberculosis patients were routinely hospitalized due to local uh, economic benefits to that and, and systems, and um, in a couple of countries that's systems. significantly changing. Um, then we didn't do that alone. That was a mobilization of partnerships to, to engage with the government. And then the last point is one that was 
discuss today, I, I think is it's a challenge for all of us, is there are more poor people in middle-income countries than there are in poor countries. Mm -hmm. And there's more HIV, TB, and malaria in those places uh, as a major emerging trend. So it, it's, it's, um, it's a challenge to... to um, deal more um, rigidly with those countries um, because the people who get hurt are the most vulnerable in those countries. And so it's, it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. So it's a yes and no answer again. <laughs> 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 Very diplomatic. <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, I, 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 I will say yes. It should be increased, especially as, uh, as, as Mark has said, that a country mustn't be determined by that the country is a middle income country or what, because at the end of the day, uh, poor people are suffering and they can't access uh, medication or other services that they need. As we speak now, a uh, treatment action campaign was we were facing closure uh, because of the status of the country that it's a middle income country and we can't uh, access don uh, funding from uh, other countries. And <coughs> an organization like us, uh, we are not taking money directly from government because we feel that if we take money from the government, it will decrease our independence, you know, because we, we won't be able to voice out whatever we want to voice out in the country and we won't be uh, able to criticize that we need to be criti to, to criticize. So we are not taking money from government, we are not taking money from, from pharmaceutical companies and we are very uh, choosy when we, it comes to funding. We, 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 we evaluate our campaigns. Recently we, we denied money, although we don't have money, but we denied money from a, a mining company because of our, our issues on TB, TB in mines. So we don't want to be fed by the donors that we Will be able to, to shut our mouth because we you know we believe that you can't bite the hand that feeds you. So, in that case, we cannot take money from government and we cannot take money from pharmaceutical companies, and they are willing to give us money. Last year on our crowdfunding, pharmaceutical companies came out and said, yes, the money, take the money. But because we know our objective, we, can, we couldn't, even medical aids, we can't take money from medical aids because poor people are suffering while they're up, uh, they upping, they are, they, are not, they are taking money from people and people e ended up suffering. So we cannot take money from those people. So we are, um, I, I will take this opportunity and appeal to, to, to donors uh, here in the room and outside of the room to come out and support TAC. You know, Stephen Lewis uh, last week just donated one million US dollars to TAC, of which it's not enough, but it will make difference. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> We're almost, we will very short have a reflection from Per Olaf Olsson, uh, but I would just like all five of you in the panel to very briefly, like maximum a minute, just to tell us what will you bring home with you from today's seminar. We can start with Alamia. I think, uh, if someone wants to send the microphone. My voice is very loud, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's telling me that. <laughs> so I don't yeah, know. but for the people on the web, if I know there are. Uh, <laughs> No, I think uh, one important thing is that many things sort of the we, the the victories the, we've we've won the fight against HIV. So donors are sort of are moving away, and the focus in in media and you know the global agendas is moving away from HIV. I think that's a huge problem. It's partly it's the UNAIDS emphasis on uh, success stories, con con uh, consistently you know pumping out success stories, and that's important in a way to show that it's possible. But it's also important to give this more complex picture of where we have uh, shortfalls and difficulties and complexities and give this you know reality check also because it, we we it, we are at risk of of you know of seeing that we we already see that funding I is reducing and this is now a window of opportunity to really make a difference and make a dent in the epidemic but then we need more funding and more focus rather than the opposite so i, I see a risk there and i hope that uh, World AIDS Day and uh, um, events like this can bring back the focus on that we're this close to, you know, we're in the semifinals. We can't stop now <laughs> because we won't reach the finals. We need to win gold. Yes. Mark, thank you. Yeah. Um, so basically for me, I think the first effect of being here is um, I think something that I take on board because I think it shows that people are still interested, are still concerned and are still willing to, to do um, 
to push the, the, the ball forward. Um, I met, I think, here now, really great presentation. I saw great presentations and, and got several ideas to, to dig into or to follow up with, with some, some colleagues here. Uh, because I think, indeed, we have our own angles and perspectives. But I think to really approach an, in such a complex uh, reality as HIV or TB treatments, I think we need a multi branch approach, of course. And we need, indeed, to bring that, that field experience, that field perspective with academic perspective, with political push and, 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 and carrots to, to, to carry it on. Uh, so I think we, we need, we are bound to work together. And I'm um, very happy that we are able to agree, sometimes disagree, uh, but the fight must go on. And and so let's certainly, I hope, meet again, uh, maybe in one or two years' time, to, to see how far we are gone uh, further and uh, what's the next priority. So I definitely uh, look forward to that. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Pia? I think I agree with a lot of what you just said. Just organizing uh, this seminar, bringing together this crowd and different perspective has been fantastic. And especially thank to you, uh, thanks to you coming from South Africa and, and sharing your experiences here uh, from your community work. That was extremely interesting. And, and to see how, much, uh, how, how far we have come, really. Uh, but also to see the, the remaining challenges at on the ground. I think that is what I take with me. Thank you. Michael? Um, I, I guess for me, the, the, what the take home and really the energizing part is the, um, the bringing together of so many ideas for um, new and different and innovative models of care. And I think as, a, as somebody coming from the medical service provision, you know, medical doctor training, as I said earlier, it's, it seems so obvious to do this, but it hasn't been, and it hasn't happened. And, and so in that sense, it's absolutely critical for HIV AIDS, but it, if you really dream, this is the way healthcare, health services ought to be delivered. So it, it, it's incredibly energizing to see this many people coalescing around this idea of using data, working in and with and through communities, um, and, and um, uh, taking the medical model in this new direction. Thank you. Steven Gila? Oh. Oh, sorry, I keep, I keep doing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't uh. <laughs> Unfortunately, I don't have a husband who will tell me that I'm loud. <laughs> However, um, I, I have a lot that to take home with. You know, I've learned a lot from this seminar, and uh, I, I was happy to learn that uh, what other countries are doing, and mostly importantly, the work of MSF. I would like to thank MSF because MSF has supported the work of HIV. You know, from <clears throat> the early age of HIV, uh, especially in South Africa, where at, uh, IRVs were not available, but MSF uh, provided ARVs to to South Africa, and especially in Kailicha. Although it was a little limited number of people, but that meant a lot, and it helped us to learn from that, or it helped uh, 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 the organization like TAC to learn from that that few people that MSF was giving a uh, medication, and we we were able to 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 take up uh, to, uh, to 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 yeah to pay, take up our struggle and show the government with evidence that these ARVs are what are, are, are they doing to people instead of uh, against what the government was saying because our minister of health by that time was saying uh, ARVs are toxic and they will ki are going to kill a lot of people today I'm living uh, from 2006 I've been taking my ARVs and I'm healthy as ever and I can do whatever uh, I want to do, of which many people in my country or in my neighborhood, they didn't think I will make it this far. I have two kids who are HIV negative uh, today uh, because of ARVs. By that time, if uh, it wasn't for MSF and the, ARV, the, 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 the pilot that they did, I wouldn't have the life that I have today. So by saying so, um, I will say, you know, I would like to say to MSF, keep on keep up the good work that we are doing. And I'll take much from the uh, donor community. I learned more of what is required from us as, 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 as organization from, f so for us to, to be able to, to access donors, you know, maybe they'll think up, uh, think up twice about funding uh, organizations like tech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mangela. <laughs> I think, 
I've, I believe that everyone in this room are very grateful as well that you made it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had the possibility to hear, to listen to you today. And I think that was very interesting. Uh, now I give the floor to Per Olaf Olsson, uh, Per Olaf Persson, sorry, <laughs> too many names today, uh, who's going to give us reflections of the day. Just a few minutes. This one. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's nice to be the last person of the day because then you get the last word. Uh, and. Um, I think it has been an uh, excellent presentation. I thank all of you for, for those. A lot of wise words have been uh, said. Um, I'm old enough to have heard most of it before. Um, th that's quite strange. Uh, window of, of opportunity, we talked about uh, around two th the year of 2000 or something like that. And all this that uh, bringing treatment, being bringing testing and treatment closer to the patient, yeah, that was uh, on the agenda at the same time. Uh, so why has so little happened? In fact, uh, that's uh, that's uh, a strange thing. Um, the general director of UN AIDS said that we have what it takes to break the HIV epidemic. We have had it for several years in fact, and still it has, hasn't been broken. I think uh, one important thing is what um, Dr. Johnson said, that uh, the medical profession, um, which has been taking the lead in a way, or, or yeah, taking the lead in, in handling the HIV infection, is extremely conservative. Um, I have experience from clinical work here in Sweden where it was uh, a lot of um, difficulties just trying to make HIV treatment nurse-centered instead of doctor-centered. Uh, it took a long time to accept that. I think it's very, very difficult for people to hand over power because with power goes money and to leave money from whatever it is, from the central government to, to uh, the p uh, peripheral uh, institutions, to hand over power from doctors to nurses, to health workers, to lay counselors. It's difficult, it's difficult. You don't leave, you don't hand over power very easily. And I think that has been, <laughs> has to be <laughs> recognized. Uh, that's one thing. I think uh, it's important with research. We've heard that, a lot of research. But it was not research that brought HIV drugs to gay people in the United States in the 1980s. It was not research that brought harm reduction to IV drug users in 1990s. It was not research that brought HIV drugs two people in, in poor countries, uh, resource-limited countries in the early years of the year 2000. It was activism. It was people who went out in the streets to claim their rights for health care. And I think you have mentioned it <laughs> from the TAC perspective. I think it has to be recognized that activism is as important as research facts. We have the facts. We need to continue to be active, to, to, to have activism. And all of us who want to be activists, we have also to realize that when we take one step forward, sometimes we have to take two steps backwards. There will be problems on the way. Mark said it recently, and Anna, Anna Mia also. There will be, be, we have to, to accept that we will not just go up upstairs, we will have to go back sometimes, like Sisyphus, who were trying to push the stone <laughs> up the hill, uh, but it went back over and over again. And as Alba Camus has said, that you have to imagine Sisyphus happy, and activists must be happy. That's important. You, <laughs> you have to send a positive positive mes message. We also have to be proactive. 
We are talking about two days, two days drugs, two days testing methods. In five years time, we will probably have an injectable drug that you just have to give uh, bi-monthly or something like that. That can also be used, used as a pre-exposure prophylaxis. And we today we have to plan for that, how to be to to act, to be activists, to make these new drugs uh, available also to, to those who need them most, people in resource poor countries. So go on, continue to be activists. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, my name is Anna Sjöblom, I work in MSF Sweden's office and Jon Gunnarsson Rutman and I want to thank everybody for, for coming here today because that's the only thing that is lost. I just checked outside and there's a little, little bit of daylight still. <laughs> you arrived on the shortest <laughs> period and the darkest. Um, so thank you first of all to Pio. Uh, you were the president in MSF Sweden when I started MSF and I think the work that you did together with Kerstin here in actually starting up the access campaign in Sweden was very important and, and we tried to carry it on. Uh, I also want to thank all the speakers who have come from far and from near. Um, and we also would like to thank everybody who was online and a special thank you to the people in Ishawi and Kwasulu Natal and thank you for the work you do on every day uh, in that project. It's very important and we would like to continue to support it. Also, uh, like always when we do events in MSF, we have people working for free. So there has been some uh, volunteers here today. Sylvia, Eva, Sara and Lauren, thank you to you. Big thank you. <laughs> and Carolina, thank you for thank you. Co being courageous, diving into this topic, which is, as we have learned and knew, very complex and very diverse. So and you also play a very important role in the future, because what we have heard here, the story about the life that uh, HIV patients need to, to carry on and to continue reporting around HIV uh, and not letting disappear from the agenda, that's your task <laughs> from now on, <laughs> well. together with many <laughs> others. So please continue to, to do this. And tomorrow is the World Ace Day. And this was, th and we think we were lucky to doing it the day before. Uh, there's, for those who are staying in Stockholm, there's several other very interesting events going on. One at Karolinska at nine o'clock in the morning. The central station will be open from, was it seven to, th to seven. seven to seven. Uh, with RFSU and other uh, organizations there. And what else is going on? You can tell me now and I will do some promo. The Karolinska actually starts at 8, 8.30 with sandwiches and coffee and at 9, from 9 to 11 with presentations at Nobel Forum, which is just, uh, you know, 10 seconds from the KI campus uh, entrance and everybody's very welcome to join that. And in the afternoon, this uh, quality of life report will be released at HIV Sweden at two o'clock between two and five at HIV Sweden, Schulbergsgatan, 20 at Södermalm. Mm. Okay, there's a small gift that we will give out. It's uh, MSF have two mandates, the medical action and the témoignage. And this is it in Swedish. So when you walk around in, in, in <laughs> Cape Town, you can get a lot of curious questions about what's there. And it's a very interesting book inside. So. Silent can kill. I thought she was going to Google it. <laughs> Here you go. And um, big applause to everybody. You probably have the book already, but. <laughs> Hello. Oh. Yeah. Do you have a book?